more and more nests all over the place. But it's a nice thing to see. Unfortunately, it's very difficult to actually see the spiders themselves. I one day want to try and see if I can find a small one and take it to the microscope in the tent. Might be a good project for our summer months when we've got a bit of rain and see if we can find those spiders on the microscope and show you what they look like and how small they really are because it's not something we get to see every day. What you can also see there is that the bush willow is slowly but surely starting to produce buds. So they're going to start flowering soon with warm weather that we've got. It's about 33 degrees centigrade or 92 degrees Fahrenheit today. So it is very hot and this warm weather is starting to get all the trees going. So we're starting to see budding happening on a lot of the trees as we forge towards summer from spring. And then we'll start to see the leaves once the first rain comes. I reckon we're in for rain fairly soon. It's gotten a bit overcast today, so it was blisteringly hot during the middle of the day. But as it's kind of the afternoon's wearing on, so this thin layer of cloud is coming through. And I believe tomorrow is going to be excessively hot. And then on Friday, it's actually going to go right down to about 23 degrees. Now that normally means that a cold front is going to arrive and maybe a bit of rain as well. So Paula, you're wondering what species of spider builds that nest. As I was saying, it's called a community nest spider. So basically it's, a, the reason it's called a community nest spider, is, as I was saying earlier, is that they all come together. So there'll be thousands of spiders inside that web. So if you had somebody that was completely petrified of spiders, that is not a web that you would want to throw on their bed because I think they would have a heart attack with the amount of spiders that would come out of there and as I was saying it's because they're so small and little that they don't have enough venom to overpray I mean to overpower prey items and so what they have to do is they have to stay together so that each one can inject a little bit of venom and that will eventually then kill that prey item and they can then feed off it so it's a very clever system to have and, and a, a wonderful way of overcoming size we see it a lot with other animals out here so you'll see in, in, and the Mara is a prime example of this the wildebeest in mass migration is how they almost counteract the lions and all the other things is because they're in such big numbers that there's a lot of eyes, a lot of ears, a lot of noses that one can detect animals but two, it lessens the likelihood of them being the individual that's hunted. If it was just one wildebeest roaming around the Mara Plains, I can guarantee that that wildebeest would not last very long at all but because there's thousands and thousands there's always going to be some that are going to escape and get away from hungry lions and various other predators that roam the plains of East Africa and the same down here in South Africa. There's impalas that group together in numbers and then on the opposite spectrum in the mammal pre uh, predators, if you think of lions, your coalitions of cheetah, they come together again. Same reason is that more numbers, easier it is sometimes to be able to overpower larger food items and get the food that you want to. So it's a very clever system to have. But I'm not sure what's actually been happening on Juma the last two days. I haven't heard too much of what's been going on. So hopefully we'll have a good afternoon and have some sort of semblance of good updates when the rest of the guys get mobile. Everybody's still at the lodges. They tend to be getting out a little bit later now because it's still quite warm. So they're starting to head out more around four o'clock. Now, Paula, are you saying hyena den, please, this afternoon? I think we will definitely head to the hyena den, but I, I think it's going to be a bit hot now for there. So I would imagine that the little ones are probably seeking shelter in the shade, and which would be inside the mound. Also, the mound is going to be a lot cooler. And the reason why is because it's got very thick walls. And so the temperature inside those mounds generally is very constant. It's not going to fluctuate. and It's not going to get too hot or cold like it does on the surface. So you find the little ones spend a lot of time in there. And I think around sunset, Hopefully they should start coming out. So we will definitely head there a little bit later What we're gonna to try to do now is try and head towards some of the water holes See if there's any elephants that are drinking also I just want to just check around and see what's been happening. Hopefully the Nkuma pride has come back I believe one of the females is sporting a rather nasty injury on her hip And so I would be nice to catch up with them The reason why I've stopped though is that there was some dwarf mongoose that ran across the road Unfortunately, it seems as though the last one went over I was generally with them is if you actually stop and you wait a little bit some of them will start creeping out onto the road they're quite curious um, animals and they like to see what's going on so I thought that there might be one or two that might come out but it seems as though the last one ran across and no more are following which is a bit of a shame 
So we'll have to just carry on trying to look for them. They're going to be very active at the moment because it's so warm. you find the best time to actually find dwarf mongoose is normally in early in the morning. So first thing in the morning when it's still cold, then they come out onto the termite mounds and they'll sit and they'll kind of absorb some sun and try and warm themselves up from the cooler night and then from there they're quite active so now it's all about foraging and looking for food and trying to find something to eat and they're going to be very happy because now that it's becoming hotter so insects and snakes are going to be a lot more active and therefore the mongoose is going to find food a lot easier than what it has over the last few months although they are very proficient at digging so they do dig out varying insects and various other things as they go so M mrs zero you reckon we should play the alphabet game Right. So for those of you who don't know what the alphabet game is, it's a game that Taylor and I played one day a while ago and it was basically to find something that is relating to nature and wildlife and what we do every day in terms of game drive that starts with each letter of the alphabet. So for example, let's say A, a would be a antelope or B would be a bird or something like that we tried to make it a little bit more specific and not so generic because otherwise it would be a lot easier and it was actually quite a challenge it was something that was quite difficult to do so we can do that I think let's keep that in the bank for later if we're struggling with any content and we're battling to find anything we certainly will play the alphabet game but let's see if we can't find some sort of animals to speak about first if we finding it's a little on the quiet side then we'll go to the alphabet game for sure because it is very good in terms of it kind of opens up everything you, you tend to look at everything as a whole you don't get sort of sucked into just animals and you look at plants and soils and all kinds of things so we will get into it I think a little bit later Seb you keen for the alphabet game you were with me last time, weren't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, Seb and I were together and we won. Yeah. Exactly, we were we were hedged as uh, as going to lose because we joined the game quite late and then we, won. we caught up very quickly. We got a bit stuck at the back end of the alphabet because we started from Z, so we were starting from the back side of the alphabet and walk, working our way forwards and we got stuck around Q's and those areas and it took us a while to kind of catch up. Although I believe if Taylor was on drive, she would be protesting profusely because she reckons that we were cheating because we were talking about all kinds of other things and so we were using horns and what was the other one that I used that she was not so happy about oh Yuri's house oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> which I suppose was a bit cheeky and not very natural but it, at the time you know you've got to do these things to try and win and so we used it and we did what we had to so <laughs> maybe we should try redo it and not use Yuri's house although J is a really tough one. It's not an easy one out here at all. Animals that occur in the Sabi Sands in Kruger. So only animals, you reckon? And birds. And birds, yeah, because otherwise we're in trouble. And plants. Well, I suppose that's what we did. Okay, we can't say damn. We can't do generic things. Okay, so we're doing it. Sebas, are we going to start this game? All right, let's do it. You got to got to think now as to what we're going to do. Let's start. So we're going to stay with. A, start with A. Now A is quite an easy one because there's lots of different A's that we can use so let's try and think of a nice one to start with A. In fact there's lots of them around at the moment. We can find red bush willows which are pretty much all the trees that I'm driving past. Most of these trees here are red bush willows which scientific name is Apiculatum. So we can use that to start off our alphabet. So all of these trees that you're seeing along here, most of these are bush willows. And actually, funny enough, talking about bush willows, is that they are one of the denser species of wood that we get out here. So here in South Africa, we have very dense woods. Some of them are so dense that they sink in water, and these bush willows are one of them. So they're all part of the Combretum family. So you'll have Combretum in Berber, which is our leadwood, which is the third densest that we get here in the Sabi Sands. And then after that is the red bush willow, and then the top densest wood is the zebra wood, which is actually a lot of it right here next to me. So there's lots of zebra wood on my right hand side. So this plant here with these lovely big spines, there is some of them as well. So they are a horrible tree for being able to off-road. They do do some damage. 
So we've got to be a bit careful of those. And this is a section where they love to grow along Triple M, between Triple M and this new road. Lots of zebra wood in this area. But we'll get back to them a little bit later because we'll save those for when we need them a little bit later. Right, so A is done. Now B. Hmm. What am I going to do for B? Maybe a Balanites will be nice. <laughs> so Ali says, my Ali says that uh, why did Ali not come into mind to start A off? Well, Ali, quite simply, because you are not anywhere where I can point a camera at you right now. So the point of the game is that you have to be able to show it on camera. So unfortunately, that's why. Otherwise, I would have. But that means that I also now I'm on the couch, apparently, which is just fine, I suppose. You've got to get on the couch every now and then, although it is quite warm these days, so the couch is not going to be that comfortable, particularly the couch at Inga's, because it's one of those, what, what would you call it? It's not leather, I suppose, or is it leather? It is, I think. Uh, I don't know. Either way, it's, it's not going to be very comfortable in hot weather, that's for sure. Right, so I can see B already, which is another tree that we get out here. So that big tree, two of them, in a row over there. My World Your Music, you say B for bees. That would be a good one. And we, we had a hive at one point. I don't know if it's still there. Maybe we should go and have a look. I almost actually killed Seb with it the one day because Seb is not, he's very allergic to bees and can't really cope with them. And I was about to off-road through this tree and he luckily pointed as we were about to hit it and it would have caused a massive disaster. Now that tree there is our bee because that is a Balanites, which is the scientific name for a torchwood. So we'll use that for B is Balanites. They've just finished fruiting. We remember we had a lot of elephants around when the Balanites were fruiting. They have this fruit that for us as people, I must be honest, think it tastes horrific. It smells as well. It's got a pungent smell and it actually reminds me a bit of an earwax kind of smell. It's a funny smell on it. I don't like it at all. And But the animals seem to absolutely love them, particularly the elephants. They shove them in by the trunk loads. And so it is really a good tree for animals and, and wildlife when they're fruiting. You find a lot of them eat it. And the torchwood name comes from the fact that it is it was used basically as a torch. So they would use branches from it. And then that seed, if you actually break down the seed and you press it, you'll get an oil from it. That oil actually burns for a very long period. So once they would then wrap it around onto a tree um, and then they would burn it and you would get this torch that would burn. So it was a very, very good tree to have around. So there's B. Right, any ideas for C? Izzy, you say our Balanites look so different here than they do in the Mara. Well, Izzy, I, uh, Izzy, I uh, would love to actually see some of the Balanites. I'm sure Steph and Jamie and Brent and James and Scott and Taylor have all shown Balanites. I must be honest, I haven't seen any from them recently, but it would be interesting. I wonder why it is the case. Maybe something to do with soil type or substrate or I don't know. I don't know, water availability, but owls tend to be very, very straight, and then with this gnarled bark, and then they kind of spread out towards the top. They're actually one of my favorite trees out here. I think they're very pretty trees. They always look beautiful. They're not ideal for driving around and for having a game drive and, and to dr try and drive over because they do puncture tires very easily, but they are beautiful trees. and particularly in the summer months when they've got these green leaves on them and they sort of sprawl out and they generally are a lot taller than a lot of the other trees in the just in this particular section and it makes it a lot easier well a nice tree to see I don't know I just like them they stand out quite a bit so one of my more favorite trees so I also decided while we're playing the alphabet game and so we can get and we can get some more ideas for C. Um, I'm going to start on the western side of Juma and slowly work my way towards the east by going north-south. <laughs> now, <laughs> Paula, you say an idea for C is a cameraman, and I think it was John you said an idea for C was a chameleon, both of which are going to be equally impossible to get on camera because, well, the only cameraman that's here at Juma is sitting behind the camera and he told me today that he's shy of the camera. But actually, we do need to go to Treehouse Dam and see a 
Oh, I'll do a time lapse so we will get him on camera just now. And there you can see a bounding springbok. So, I mean, springbok. springbok. Sorry, I don't know what's going on, Seb. I don't know why I thought of Springbok at all. Steenbok. It's the heat, exactly. I'll just say that my brain is being cooked. But it is a bounding Steenbok that was jumping away from me. And you can see how well they camouflage once they lie down. But nice to see. Lots of them in this area. I'm sure that's why Shadow spends a lot of time this side of the world is because there is a lot of Steenbok and Diker that roam around in this grassy area and this is going to be I think one of my favorite sections in summer. I remember doing a bushwalk here in late summer and the insect life that was in this grassy section was amazing. There was spiders, there was assassin bugs, there was caterpillars, there was all kinds of stuff and I think once we get to summer now that it's been there's a road and it's also been cleared a little bit they got rid of a lot of the black monkey orange and they cleaned it out a little bit and I think once we get to that or to summer it's now going to be a absolutely beautiful place to walk and I think we're going to get lots of Ellie's here and of course well Shadow and her cub have spent a lot of time so it's going to be a great place to walk we were going to be walking tomorrow morning but if there's no internet connection in the Mara which it's possible then it's going to be a little tough to do three hours of walking by ourselves because we have to think of poor Seb's bicep he doesn't have biceps like Byron unfortunately and so you know holding the camera for three hours non-stop is not the easiest feat to do so we'll just monitor it but if Mara is with us then I think we will walk tomorrow I'm quite keen to actually be on foot and to see what's happening and to check around the ongoings and see if anything has started to come alive. The last time I did a walk wasn't too much in the way of insect life or, or anything like that and no flowers yet but it is starting. We can see a lot of the trees are starting to bud a little bit and so a walk might be a good idea. Chameleons though, getting back to sea. Oh. No, say, sit, 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 sit because you're my sea. No, it's flown away. There was a canary there, but it's now flown away. So we're going to have to try and find another sea. But let's check. No. So, I, so chameleons are going to be tough. We're going to have to wait until nighttime. And also not too many of them around just yet. Um, they're waiting, I think, for more of the vegetation to grow and a little bit more rain to fall. But we'll try and look for them. And there was a suggestion of crocodile and um, civet. Both of those crocodiles should be quite easy. Andy, you said civet. So civet would be nocturnal, which would be a bit of a problem because we're trying to win our game as much as possible. So we need to get hold of seas quite early on. Now, what are you on top of the tree? Now, that's completely backlit, so difficult to see. So it looks like a sabota lark that is sitting there. You can see the big prominent white eye stripe and heavy bill and beak. And there are a few sabota larks around. So that's not any help for our sea, but still nice to see. I know Byron had a couple of them in his bird challenge that he did. And they're drifting around. You often find them in small groups. Just to your right, there's one there. There we go. So you'll find that they have a heavy white eye stripe and then quite a thick set beak. So there we go. And you can see the little bush willow pods on the back, russet bush willow pods. We could use russet bush willow as well because we use red bush willow for A, russet bush willow. The family name is Combritum. So we can use that for our C so that we can keep going and then get on to D. So there we go. That's our Combritum for C. Onward. What are we going to do for D, Seb? What do you want for D? Seb? Oh, we could have used these Juma. <laughs> no, remember we said we're not going to use dams and things. We have to sh we have to show animals and things like that. Um, Diker, Diker would be a good one. We should find one of those. That's a nice one to use actually. I like that because it's an animal, and we haven't seen any animals yet this afternoon. It's surprising because generally this particular oh we have we've seen a springbok slash steenbok, a steenbok that is graduated to become a springbok apparently, according to my brain. No, of course it is a steenbok. 
dwarf mongoose, Robin. That's a good one as well. I didn't think of that. And we had a dwarf mongoose earlier. And there are some that hang around in this particular section. I've seen them quite often running around here. But it might be a little hot to see them now. But let's go, let's go slowly. Wild dog, wild dog, dove. I suppose dog, wild dog would be more for W though. I think I would use that for W. A dove would be also an easy one. There's another little Steenbok. Let's have a look at this Steenbok because it is sitting beautifully out in the open. Sylvia, are you wondering if there's any dogwood trees in the Kruger? Sylvia, I have never heard of a dogwood in the Kruger National Park system, so I don't think there is. Um, well, I'll ask around and just check, but it might be if there anywhere it would be in the ride in the northern reaches of the park. I don't know the tree ecosystem in the north very well. They have a lot of very specific trees along the Levuvu and the Limbombo and um, Limpopo rivers, but no, there's not really any down this side of the world. So even if we were looking for a dogwood and it did occur in the Kruger, it's definitely not down this part of the world. And so we would not be able to find it. But there goes our Steenbok. It lost its nerve. Little female. They are very beautiful antelope. I really love Steenbok. They have this beautiful red coat with this little white tummy. And the most interesting thing is between their back legs is jet black. So a lot of people don't know that. But just between their back legs they have this like black section of fur. It's really quite pretty actually. Not that you ever see a Steenbok upside down other than when unfortunately it has expired due to some sort of predator. You know what, before we head off down this way I actually want to go and just quickly check up on our vulture nest because we have a vulture nest here on Philemon's cut line and I haven't been to it for quite some time so I want to see how big the chick is. Oh I've got a D all around us actually but let's use that pile over there Seb. So D is for dung this afternoon. So there is our dung pile. You can see a massive, massive midden for impalas. So that's a male impala that's defecated there. That's all his pellets and lots of males probably that have been territorially dominant over se this section when it was the mating season. They would have all defecated there and urinated there. And that's the males. And then if you zoom out a little bit, Seb, you'll see that there's a big clump and then small little clumps around it. Now, the little clumps around it generally are the females and younger males that will be defecating in close proximity to where the male does. So there's those little round balls of processed grass and leaves. There we go. D. Right. E. Elephant. Let's try to find an elephant. That's what I want to do. Or we can do... I can do E right now as well because we can show Gwaris because that's Euclea divinorum. Maybe let's use E for something else. If I get stuck I can always go to the Gwaris because there's lots of them around. But it would be nice to have elephants for E. Ah, our vultures are on the nest. Now I can't see the little one yet. Let's try go around though. I remember the alphabet game was super easy from like A to R, S, T around that area. Then it became super tough. The last few letters of the alphabet are not easy out here at all. But we will, I'm sure, be okay and find what we need. Egyptian goose, Norena. That's a good one for E as well. I like that. And we are heading towards Treehouse Dam. So if there's no elephant at Treehouse Dam, we will get an Egyptian goose for sure. But I just want to have a little quick check on our vulture. You can see there's the adult white-backed vulture that's sitting on the nest. Well, it looks like the adult. You can see a couple of the white feathers actually. Bless you, Seb. Thank you. You all right? Yep. But dusty out here, isn't it? Now, you can see a few white feathers. Those are the down feathers from the chick, which is over there. There's the little chick's poking its head up. So it must be molting some of its down feathers and starting to get its adult plumage, well not adult plumage, but it's immature plumage, so it's proper feathers and proper wings and a few of the little soft down feathers when it was born as a chick are starting to come out and being trapped in the branches around that area. Now white-backed vultures are an interesting one because they're a bird that I really love to watch in nesting season. They tend to start getting into nests quite early in the year, so June, July is when they are prepping nests. They then lay their egg and they'll incubate that egg for about 44 to 45 days the egg then hatches 
and then after that that chick is nest bound for quite some time it will be at the nest for about 150 days it's a very long period so that adult has really got to have its wits about it or the, the, the pair that is here and they've got to provide food for this chick for that amount of time it really is a huge commitment and then they do it all again the very next year they don't take a break so sometimes when you have long nesting birds they'll then sometimes miss a season but these guys don't they will breed every season and so the process will start again in June July just after this one has fledged and moved off which is quite amazing and when we see things like this it is super encouraging because unfortunately vulture numbers have declined massively across the world not only here in South Africa but every part of the world has unfortunately lost a huge percentage of their vulture numbers through various things here in, in South Africa we have a lot of problems with um, livestock being poisoned so carcasses that have been taken by jackals caracals leopard farmers often poison that carcass to try to get rid of that predator and the, the result is that the vultures come and eat off it and they then poison and die and the other so big 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 problem and probably the most the, well, the biggest percentage of birds that die is through strikes into electric lines so power lines telephone cables these birds fly into them particularly in the low light hours so early morning late afternoon and they get hit by those electrical cables and they then succumb to that so that's caused a lot of problem and then obviously habitat loss has also been a massive problem too so these animals in cities and towns and, and areas where people have started to inhabit big trees like this get cut down and there's really no place for the vultures to nest what is also quite cool with vultures is you can often, even if the vultures weren't there, you can kind of work out whose nesting or whose nest it is just from where the nest is positioned in the tree. Whiteback vultures generally will like a nest like this where it's in one of these more open sparse trees. So this is a marula that doesn't have leaves because we're now in the winter months and it's fairly on the edge of the tree so it's easy to get in and out of it. It's not too bad. If you look at something like a hooded vulture, their nest site will be in a completely different place so their nest site will be normally along a watery area they like to nest in scotias and jackalberries and the reason why is they like a very shaded very um, hidden nest so they don't like to be out in the open and their nest seems to be deep into the tree so they're often right in the middle of the tree and then your lapid face and white headeds tend to be right on the crown of trees so they tend to be right on the top of a tree where you can see it quite clearly and then your cape vulture which is another vulture species we get here they tend to be cliff nesters so they like to find mountainous areas where they can nest on cliffs and that's where you find them so quite cool that you can identify just from the nest roughly which species it is of course there's always anomalies to these things but that is pretty much it Paula, in terms of eggs and how many they lay a year, they will lay two eggs in a year. So remember they lay an egg, um, the two eggs now in this sort of July period. And what will generally happen is either the one egg doesn't hatch or if both um, chicks hatch out of it, you'll find a situation where the old or the stronger chick, so it might be the slightly older one, it might be the one that just physically is a bit stronger, it's able to get to the food from the parents first in the first few days or it hatched first that will then generally kill the other one and siblicide is hugely common in vultures and very 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 seldom in fact 99.9% .9 of the time it will only be one chick that will survive so that's why we see the one there there might have been two but it's generally only the one that will be raised to adulthood if she lost both of them there is a chance that they will breed again and she might lay again um, but obviously it, it's difficult for them because their incubation period and their and their period of looking after the chick is so long that that then impacts on their chance to to breed in the next season so it's difficult it depends on how long until that if that chick survives now this chick is going to do a lot to stay alive and that's why you'll find that one adult generally stays here because of the nest position and how open it is and how there is a lot of of predators that will see this so you'll find things like leopard um, I've seen leopards going into vultures nests and killing the chicks uh, as well as varying other um, raptors you'll find owls so things like the giant eagle or Verose eagle owl we know that it had a bird kill the other day at twin dams we saw a Verose eagle owl on a kill so they'll go after this then you'll get civets genets um, snakes there's a lot of different predators but if the adults are there they generally can cope with it the only thing that would really kind of be able to do this easily would be a leopard 
but it would be a leopard that would have to take a chance because that branch is not very easy to get to and that's why these white back vultures like to put them up in that area. It's also why the hooded vultures are doing so badly it's because their nests tend to be a lot lower and in areas with dense predators. So Sinak, you're wondering how long it is until they learn how to fly. So there was a nest at Chitwa when I was working there, very close to the lodge, and it was great because I get I used to watch that vulture fly every day and will learn to fly every day. Um, they start flying already at about 120 days, 130 days they're starting to, to fly. So they're starting to just take short little flights around their nest and they're fully fledged and fully able to fly already by the 150 days then they're out and they're flying around and doing their thing so it's not a very sh long process once they've got the adult feathers and, and then those big wings it takes a few times of flapping and a bit of uncoordinated plunging to the sort of lower depths of the tree and onto the ground even sometimes and then they get it right within a few days and, and by the time they've sort of 30 40 days has passed since they've started flying those muscles are strong and they're able to then start soaring and fly these incredible heights that vultures cover so it really is an amazing thing when you see these guys going but super happy to see that our chick is surviving i think we're going to carry on and leave them to it i've disturbed them enough this afternoon and i believe seb was telling me actually that there's another nest now that's close to Gauri Dam so we might have a little check on that later if we're struggling for V we'll come and try and find Vulture but we found lots of different little things for the lower end of the alphabet so hopefully we'll find an E now and then we can move on. I've already thought for F we can maybe do fire finches that would be quite nice I haven't seen that many fire finches recently although they are around it's just difficult to get them on camera. Um, a fin foot would be nice. Imagine if we had a fin foot. Of course, we won't see that here because fin foots are river birds, but that would have been cool. What else? Forktail Fork drongo. Forktail drongo. Seb, that should be an easy one. We should be able to find that fairly easily. What else is with an F? Hmm. Chris Rogue, you suggest a frog. Well, Seb and I know exactly where to find a frog, although it's not a frog, is it? It is a toad, so we would not be able to use it because we have, at the moment, we have a eastern olive toad that is living in the swimming pool at Ingers that is pretty much driving Seb and I crazy because it starts at about 6.30, just in time for us to finish our drive, and then it starts with its bellowing call. Now, its bellowing call is a reminder about work, basically. It just says work, work. So I'll play it for you now and it is a deep very loud very Interesting call that is made and I'll show you what actually an eastern olive toad looks like because they're actually quite pretty little things um, And I'm super excited about this because Even though he's keeping me awake at night, and he's a little bit on the loud side It's a good sign that we are going to start getting more frogs and I always like frogs I know Taylor is also a big frog fan, so I'm going to be happy about it. So let me turn off and I'll play you the call that we have to listen to every night. Now you would think that this frog would grow tired of that call, that monotonous work-like call all afternoon or evening, but no. It just goes from sunset to sunrise no problem it's perfectly happy and it sits on the little cleaning so we have this thing that we call a creepy crawly which is basically it's a cleaner self cleaner of the pool and it has a pipe and it sits on the pipe and that's where it kind of calls from and then during the day it's very clever it goes into the little weir basket so it has it it's perfectly hidden and nobody can get to it and that's why it's surviving so a very clever frog although I'm sure the chlorine is not very good for it at all because chlorine can't do well for their skin well, prolong, prolonged periods of chlorine and acid should not really go down too well when it comes to a frog or a toad but a frog would be nice I was wondering where we'd find a frog Yami, you say Franklin that's also another easy one Lots of easy ones for F. Like I say, the beginning of the alphabet is good. So E, I've, I've postponed E a little bit because I'm hoping that E will get elephants. But if we don't at Treehouse Dam, I know either there's going to be an Egyptian goose or at least there's a quarry. And like I say, both of those are E's. So I can get that quite quickly. Now you might be thinking why a quarry is an E, but like I was saying earlier, its scientific name is Euclid. So 
nuclear starts with an E, and that can be our E for the day. Although that sounds pretty dodgy. You don't really want to be telling people I'm going to have my E for the day, because there's E is obviously a slang word for things that you shouldn't be doing in life. No tracks of any leopard around. So apparently there's some Nyala on the dam camp, so that's our N for later. We've got lots of things lined up for the alphabet, so we're going to be okay, I think. I think we'll get through it. It'll be a, a good job if we do. It's just got to get to the the areas that we need to for certain letters and so while we're doing that we're just kind of bumbling around and checking out what's going on i'm also keeping an eye out for any tracks remember that yesterday i was tracking a female leopard towards this area so i was just checking and making sure that maybe that little leopard didn't come this way it looks like a young female and the more i, sw I went and spoke to herbie and herbie and i had a lo little look at those tracks and he's convinced that they're Shongile's. So, and the pattern that she moved would be very much Shongile's track. What is that on the damn wall there? Something on the damn wall. Maybe it's just a dead branch, but it's kind of a rusty color. I think it is just a branch, but I thought for a second it was one of our leopards sitting on the damn wall, but it's not, unfortunately. Right, Treehouse Dam, what have you got for us? You've got an Impala, which is for I, but we're not quite there yet. There's a Blacksmith Lapwing. Are there no Egyptian geese here? Are you kidding me? <laughs> That's amazing. I would have thought we would have seen Egyptian geese for sure. There's our ox peckers for O later in the day. Sorry, Impalas, I just want to try get round and see if we can't find our Egyptian goose quickly. I'm sure there must be an Egyptian goose here somewhere. There's always Egyptian geese at Treehouse Dam. Of course, it's that it's how it goes. Is when you're looking for something, and you get to an area like this, and you kind of oh, I'll find it, no problem. Then you look, and there's nothing there, and it's a bit perplexing, actually. So, time lapse. Ah, yes. Sorry, Seb. Your time lapse. I forgot about that. Well, Seb, you can put. When you do your time lapse, if you put it on one of those Gwari trees, then I can do those for E, so we can start moving on in the alphabet while you do your time lapse. The Sev is so diligent with his time lapse, he does it every afternoon without fail, which is fantastic. It's really going to be very nice. I hope it will be nice. After all of this, otherwise, you're going to be in trouble. I think uh, some of the presenters, although it's just me really, so you're not going to be in trouble because I quite like the idea. So let me park here, and if you, like I say, can just show my guari tree on the other side of the dam, then I'll chat about my guari tree while you do your business. Be careful of Scuba Steve and his friend that was wandering around here. We don't want Seb to be eaten by a hippo, although there's no sign of a hippo that I can see anyway. Right, so that is our guari bush that you can see on the other side. So that's E for us, Euclid divinorum. Now, divinorum... This comes about because this tree is used to divine water. Surprise, surprise. Now there's a thing about that that really is quite interesting because you speak to some people and they are absolutely convinced that this tree does find water. So how they do it is they cut a Y-shaped branch. That Y-shaped branch, they then walk with it. And when the Y-shaped branch starts to point downwards, that is where there is water. Now the reason why it works and why people do find water is because quarry trees always grow in and around water. So they grow along drainage lines, they grow along sort of riverine paths, around water courses like this, or dams that we see at Treehouse. And so that's why generally it works, is because there is water right there. I don't think the tree itself actually has a magnetic pull to water in any way. But if you try and argue that with some people, they will probably shoot you or kick you in the knees, at least, because they are very, very, very into that belief. What is really true with this plant is that you can use it for a multitude of different things. It's actually a very useful plant, particularly at this time of the year, because we are now in a situation where we're very hot and dry, fires are going to be a big problem. And that tree is one of the best things you can do if you have a fire in this area. It works perfectly to beat a fire. So if you hit fire flames with it, and the tree itself, because of the, the leaves and the way it is, it basically suffocates the oxygen and the fire goes out. So it's a really handy one to have. It's also great for dust. If you've got dust around, you can then hit 
those leaves against whatever's dusty and the dust tends to kind of come off and so truckers love that tree they often hit their cooler boxes and their hot boxes with it that sit on the back of the car and get dusty in this winter so they'll use that for there so there we go that's our guari bush you can see the camera shook a little bit which means that our friend Sebastian is safe and back on the vehicle Aileen you want to know how we spell guari bush so it's G A U double R I guari that's how you spell it and that particular one there is a magic guari so the magic part is the same as the divinorum part it becomes because this plant can divine water so that's how that works but there is another species of guari that we get in this area called the natal guari now to tell the difference between the two of them is quite easy the magic guari has got a wavy leaf so the leaf undulates whereas the natal guari has got a nice straight edged leaf and is quite flat so that's how you can tell the difference between the two now seb you may need to just move your camera a little bit to the left given that i'm going to turn left so you can go to the left if you want or you can do that battalier eagle that's flying over there so that's another one for e if we really wanted to eagle there's a battalier that's flying in the distance slowly but surely away from us Interesting though that that battalier actually took off from where we are now So I wonder if it didn't come for a drink potentially here at Treehouse Dam and just decided to have a bit of water It's disappearing behind the tree there. There it goes Not easy when it's flying away from you and low to the ground and that particular individual is a young battalier And the reason why I know that is because it's still brown in coloration when they get older They will change they will start to get white and black and a brown saddle on their back but this particular bird is still very much brown coloration and the tail is still quite long on this battalier as they get older that tail will shorten a little bit well done Sebastian that was not easy that bird was flying at speed and away from us so well done very good now James, you're asking, I wonder if any of the Wahlberg's eagles have been seen and hopefully the dark morph or pale morph pair has arrived. James, we saw one yesterday morning. So the dark morph of that pair that is around Twin Dams, we saw it yesterday perched close to Twin Dams and it was causing a bit of a heart attack to all the grey go-away birds in the area. They were not very impressed by this Wahlberg's arriving back, but exciting, isn't it, that they are back. I really want the pale forms to arrive, and we know the pale form is one of them that nests at Twin Dam, so maybe the, pair, the partner is just slightly waylaid and will start coming into this area soon. Right, where are we on the alphabet now? F. Are we on F? Yes, we're on F. Okay, so F we've got covered. We've got quite a few options for F already, as discussed. What's after F? G. Okay, I'll think about that. Aaron, you're wondering about a bird that I really love seeing, particularly because they're just so incredible to watch when we have these termite hatches, and those are the aim of falcons, and you, you're wondering when we're going to see them. They tend to arrive a little bit later, Aaron, so we tend to find they arrive normally late November, early December, so still a little bit of time before they get here. They're not one of the first migratory birds to arrive, but they really are a bird that, in my mind, is just, it's such a tragedy what's happening to them. Their numbers are declining at a rate of knots. So every year, less and less and less of these beautiful birds are arriving back here in South Africa because they are netted by the hundreds when they congregate to leave on their migratory route. And it's really sad to see those kind of things happening. So unfortunately, there is a lot of that that's going on and hopefully it will all disappear and stop and we'll be able to see them bouncing back because it is an amazing bird to watch flying around and like I say when they hunt those winged alits from the termites that hatch after the rains it is the most amazing things to see I remember last year it was late January no well, it couldn't have been late January early January when I left Simbambini just before I started at Safari Live and um, we had we were at Simbambini and there's a big open area there and close to a dam and all these winged alits were in the air and these Amo falcons, there must have been, I would say, probably about 20 to 30 of them. And I, Ali was with me actually, so she'll remember this. And they were just dive bombing in and grabbing these little alits on the wing and with their 
beaks or with their feet and then putting them in. It was amazing to watch. It really was a very special display of agility because those alerts, while they're not the fastest flying, they're pretty nimble in the way that they're able to kind of bank and turn quite quickly. But that falcon was able to do that just as fast and find exactly what it needs. So, really quite impressive. Hmm, if, 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 if. Drongo, where are you Drongos? Normally everywhere, now I can't find one of you. I need to find an animal for Drongos because generally the Drongos are around animals. Starling, no, you're a little bit later in the day. We will get to you when we need S because we've already passed B so we can't use it for B. A fly for F. Well, there's no shortage of them this afternoon. They've been bugging us constantly but getting them on camera is a whole different story, but I will try. Let's see if we can test Sebastian's skills. Seb, are you up for a challenge? Yeah, always. always. Okay. Always. Well, then we shall try a challenge. You. Let's try find a fly. I just might just skip F for two seconds because we are going towards Janet Jackson's home. So maybe we get G for Janet Jackson. So let's just quickly check yeah, and then we'll get back to F and because, oh, look at that. Now I know it's not a F or a G, but look at how beautiful that tail is in that afternoon light. That's the lilac breasted roller and it's got its tail spread. I wonder if it's not going to nest here. It would be a very bad place to nest, lilac breasted roller. Do not nest there because that hole there is going to have a genet lurking as a neighbor and genets love nothing more than little eggs and chicks so don't nest in that area it's not going to be a good place for you but look at those colors is that not just i know we see them often and they are a common bird but they are just so exquisite they've got these beautiful colors all over them and really when the sun is at a in this late afternoon or early morning stage and these guys especially have their wings spread like that or their or their tail spread should i say they really show off that electric blue that they've got and i love the streamers so the little tail streamers that come off the bottom are quite amazing as well so very pretty but not a place you want to spend time as a roller in terms of a nesting area and they love this kind of stuff they like to nest in holes in trees like this so maybe it nested there last year and wants to nest again but Janet as a neighbor is not an ideal individual although that nest is quite small I don't think our Janet would be able to fit in there you never know though they are quite res resourceful little animals but let's check quickly if Janet is home I wonder if uh, I was hoping my roller would stay there but it's flown away it would have been nice if it did because we would have been able to get some beautiful close-ups right Seb we might be have to be quick with this as we know our Janet is quite a fast one no, not home today. Janet Jackson really is, does live the lifestyle of the rich and famous, tends to never be at home. It always seems to be on holiday and moving around and very shy when it comes to the paparazzi, so it does a good job at hiding away from us. I have seen it here recently, just a flash of spots. So Roshni, you reckon she's gone to the spa? Well, it's hot today, Roshni, so maybe she's at the pool sipping cocktails with her friends. That's what I think she's doing. Tuesday afternoon, pool time, cocktails, happy. If it's a girl, if it's a guy, well, I don't see why things would change either. Either way, he's probably having a spa and pool day with a cocktail and taking it easy. Hopefully it's not at the beach because then it will be very, very lost. Our Janet is then headed completely in the wrong direction and very far east into Mozambique and probably won't make it back this side of the world anytime soon. Okay, so we still need F, still need G because that we can't tick off. There goes a bounding squirrel, which would be nice for S later, but it's not one we can use. Are you going to sit still, squirrel? No. Roshni, you also say flower. Hmm, what's flowering at the moment? The wild pears should be flowering, the dombeas, but I haven't seen any yet on Juma. Sausage trees, well when we go to Chitwa we'll be able to get sausage tree flowering on the deck there. Um, the quarry is actually flowering. We can use a quarry, I suppose, for F as well. But that's a good idea, Roshni, that's an easy one. Although you'll think that all of these things are easy, drongos and flowers and yet here we are driving without it. I'm sure we will find one fairly shortly. 
I actually think maybe while I'm thinking about F and slowly on my way to Twin Dams, it might be a good idea to actually get an update as to what's going on because I haven't been listening to my radio at all. There might be a sighting running and I just haven't heard. And I don't want to bump anybody's sighting if they've got three vehicles. Afternoon stations mobile, any updates? So we just chat to the guides quickly and just get a quick update as to what's happening. If they want to talk to me, of course, because it seems like no one wants to say hello. No, there we go. Aubrey's going to save us. Hmm. Sounds like it's very quiet, apparently, according to Aubrey. Okay, copy that. Thanks. There will be no updates on the Nkuma Pride. So it sounds like a Birmingham in Torchwood, but other than that, nothing else. Hello, little impalers. How are you all doing? Yes, don't look at me as though I'm mad for saying hello. Listen to all their feet as they walk through the grass. It's quite cool. I can't imagine the noise that those herds must make, especially with these sensitive mics that we have on the cameras. I would love to hear those wildebeest herds if we just sat in silence and just heard them walking through the grass. Imagine there would be quite a lot of noise because when you get big buff herds, you hear the noise and, and even these impalas, like I say, when they were scattering from us just now, lots of rustling of the grass. But they again are one of the most beautiful animals we have out here. Really enjoy spending time watching impalas. I know they are common and a lot of people don't really like to spend too long with them, but I can tell you there's been countless times where I've sat and we've been chatting about impalas and just watching them with guests, particularly guests that are on their first safari and it's their first afternoon and inevitably, generally, impalas are one of the first animals you come across and I always like to spend a lot of time with them and I can't tell you how many times I've had crazy sightings from just sitting watching impalas. All of a sudden a leopard bounds out of the bush or wild dogs come running across or some sort of animal arrives. It's, it goes to show that even looking at the smaller stuff sometimes is a very good win and you can lead you to luck in other departments. So I always like seeing them. And look how big they've gotten. You think that that was a tiny little baby nine months ago. My world, your music, you say you agree impalas are great animals. Well, they are. Imagine if they were rare. People would love to see this antelope because they do have striking markings. They've got these beautiful black stripes on the rump. They've got those three different colors, so that darker red and then that tan and, and white on the chest and then bits of black on the face. And then they've even got those little black metatarsal glands that look like ballerina socks on the back foot. And it really is a, an exquisite looking animal. So it's just because they're so common people overlook them. But I find actually, and in terms of even photographically, they're one of the most beautiful animals, particularly in late afternoon or early morning light because that coat color just gets so rich with the orange tone of the light that we get here. It is really is very pretty. Paula, you want to know at what age your impala is considered fully grown? Well, at about... Well, it's difficult because with the females, they sexually mature and they're mating. Whether they're fully grown or not is another discussion. But they already are mating within their sort of second year. So they're born in November, December. They then, for the first year, don't mate. And then they will born... I mean, they will mate the following April. So they're already mating at that time. They might not be fully, fully grown, but they are already sexually mature. The males, however, they only reach in terms of their horn size and adult size that they can compete for mating at three and a half years. So for them, they might body-wise have reached fully grown at two, but their horns haven't quite gotten that big yet and therefore they can't challenge so three and a half for the males is really the earliest that they'll start mating most of the successful males are, are around four and a half five and a half in their mating seasons and then obviously you get the older ones that go from there but fully grown probably around two years would, is what i would imagine for the skeletal structure to stop growing it would be an interesting thing to know maybe if some of you do know hashtag safari live or youtube chat if you know exactly how long it takes for the impala skeletal structure to stop growing
no one likes me as we're talking about ages of them growing you you're wondering what the lifespan is of an impala well it depends here in the sabi sands a lot of them is not very long is the answer to that no i'm just kidding they, most of them will live to in this area generally about seven to to nine years old very seldom go past that and um, as they get a little bit older they get a bit slower and and because of the density of predators here lion leopard wild dog hyena cheetah absolutely hammer them so here only seven to nine but in captivity they can go as much as 12 13 so they not very long-lived animals but they do reproduce quickly and i mean if they're already mating at a year and a half or old i suppose they can produce quite a number of little ones before they expire of old age and there's a beautiful ram that you've got there so he's going to be in line to mate next year he's definitely a more mature individual Lori, you're wondering if they shed their hair in the winter. No, in winter their hair gets slightly thicker and longer. Because remember, our winter it's drier and colder here. In summer it becomes too hot. When there's temperatures of 100 to 120 degrees Fahrenheit, these antelope can't have thick coats in the summer. So they'll actually um, shed a little bit and the, and the fur gets less dense during the summer months. beautiful herd no drongo though i'm surprised because drongos generally are with impala herds they're normally flocking around picking off insects and grabbing little things as they go so i'm surprised that we don't have any drongos with them hmm interesting i wonder if they would get any little fire finches here this is a good place for fire finches as well what are these tracks here No, no good. Frank, you want to know if I've ever eaten impala meat? I have, Frank, um, a few times actually. It, it is a very, very, very lean, very tasty meat actually. It doesn't have too much of a gamey taste. It's not as gamey as the northern hemisphere venison. Um, so it is actually quite tasty and, it, and it, in South Africa there's a lot of places where they actually will farm venison quite extensively so that they can um, you know people will either hunt them or they will produce them for venison trade so they're not taken out of these natural systems like the Sabi Sands they are sort of gotten by um, people that actually have farmed them and you just go and buy it from the shops itself so it is fairly tasty I can see why lions and leopards and everything under the sun likes a bit of impala. They're not the worst tasting animals. Mm. Hmm. F, 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 F. What are we going to use for F? There's not much here at Twin Dams either. I wonder where all our leopards are at the moment because the guys say to me they haven't seen a leopard since for two days now, not even tracks, which is surprising. And I'm sure there must be one of our spotty friends around. It's just a matter of finding said individual. I'm going to check up towards Chelapan and then down the Mulawati. Ah, there's F right there next to us. Don't run away. There, that side. Or that side, whichever side you want. There we go. There's a Franklin that is moving through the bush. A crested Franklin that is just bobbing its neck off. As they do they always walk with as though they've got lots of attitude and little neck bobs and they are beautiful I really like crested Franklins look at those markings on their wings everyone often overlooks them because from far they tend to blend in and they look quite drab and it's browns and horrible colors but they've actually got this kind of chestnut color with these little white flecks that white eye stripe so I actually quite like them I think they're quite pretty birds obviously they also cause heart attacks regularly for trackers because they all explode out of a thicket as you come around a corner tracking a lion or a leopard as you think the tracks are fresh and next thing there's a squawking franklin flying at you it's enough to give you a heart attack so i'm surprised more franklins are not blown away by a rifle by novice guides because they really do give you a fright from time to time right g sebastian what are we going to do for G, 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 G? Hmm, that is a good one. Ali, my Ali, suggests golden-breasted bunting. Now, 
there were some golden breasted buntings earlier that I saw. What are all of these guys that we've got here? There's lots of different things. I think these might be southern grey-headed sparrows though, which is not going to help me much. And there was H, which I wanted to really use because H is going to be a bit of a tougher one. And it was here, but it's, I can't see it anymore. Do you see where that hoopoe flew to? There was a hoopoe here, an African hoopoe. I suppose hornbill I could use as well for H. Golden breasted buntings. I've seen hundreds of them, but now none when you need them. There goes a hornbill. So there's H. I suppose we've skipped G, but it's all right. We'll get back to G just now. We'll take H while we can. Uh, it's fine. We'll get to, we'll get him later. Don't worry. There definitely will be a hornbill somewhere along the line. Hmm. Golden breasted bunting. Where have you gone? There were hundreds of you earlier. <coughs> Bless you, Seb. Noah, you say giraffe, that would be a nice one too, and a fairly easy one to spot, you would think. So maybe we'll get lucky with a giraffe somewhere around here. They do like this area, often see giraffe around twin dams, and um, they like to kind of hang around along these sections, so maybe I'll get lucky. I actually haven't, uh, there's tracks for a giraffe right now, so there we go. I don't know if they're fresh tracks, but there is tracks of a giraffe heading north up the road. Can we use giraffe tracks? I don't know, can we, Seb? There we go, on our right hand side here is the giraffe tracks, so coming up the road. Megs, what do you think? Megs, you're the referee, you need to tell us. Giraffe track, yes or no? No, I'm guessing. But there's a giraffe track going up. That's a big bull giraffe that seems to have walked here today sometimes because it's on top of all the vehicle tracks, so I'd imagine that that giraffe is somewhere close. So Megs has said no to my giraffe track, so I will have to find a giraffe itself. Tough crowd today. Thought you would give me some slack, Megs. I'm all on my own out here. No, it's fine. Got a stern but fair, stern but fair is okay. Raiza, you say go away bird. I was just thinking the exact same thing as well as about a go away bird and you would think you would find one of those fairly easily too, but it seems that, that go away bird is also not present at the moment. They're always around this section too. You see them a lot at Twin Dams. But today when you need a go-away bird, there's no go-away bird. We're falling behind a bit here, Seb. We're going to have to get our game up because time is ticking and we're still only on G. Hello, Impalas. Oh, sorry. Sorry, girls. Mia, you say GNU. Again, another one that's a really good suggestion. I think between all of your suggestions, we'll eventually get this right. Hmm. Grey-headed bushrike would be another one in this area that we could use. I saw one earlier just scooting across the road and we didn't actually get it. Just checking all the tops of the trees for the go-away birds because they like to sit in this area. And at the moment there is fruiting jackalberries along this section. What were you guys here? That's no, they all flew away. Sorry, Seb, don't worry. What have you got, Seb? They flew away. David, giant eagle owl, good call as well. We're in a great place for giant eagle owls. When I drop into the Mulawati, it'll be better for them, but I will look for them too. That's not a bad bird as well to go for. Of course, all I'm doing is trying to delay the inevitable to get to L and then have a leopard. That's all I want, really. Uh, after that, the alphabet game will just fall away completely, but <laughs> one can live in hope that that will happen, although I think I'm wishful thinking at this stage because everybody would be super happy with the leopard. It sounds as though the guys are really struggling to find them. Kathy, Jim Najin, or a giraffe. How about that? See, Megan, I tracked the giraffe and now look, it's led us to the real letter. <laughs> so there's our giraffe right there. So there's G off the list. Hello giraffe. It's a beautiful big male. It's our male that we saw ye yesterday morning. It was yesterday morning. Yeah. I can't even remember now. But it is the male we saw yesterday morning. I think the dark, dark, dark male that's walking a little gingerly. Seems to be on a go slow. Even yesterday he was walking quite slowly. But he is absolutely beautiful. He's dark, dark, dark in color. And is v I always love these kind of almost black giraffe they're very pretty 
You can see he's having a bit of a hard time with the ox peckers that are biting flies. Let's just try to see if we can go forward. I know that the sun is not great for you, Seb, but it's just through this tree is not so nice either. Because this should be a lot better from here. Yeah. There we go. There's our beautiful giraffe. That is as beautiful as it can get with a bit of cloud above it and a few trees. And you can just see how they dwarf these trees. If I had to stand there, that giraffe would leg would be about the height of me. So it really is a beautiful big individual. I love these big male giraffe. And he's not old, old, old. The first time I saw him, I thought he would be old just given his coloration, but he's actually not that old. If you look at his head, while he does have a few ossicones that have developed, I mean, thick ossicones that have developed and a few sort of knobbled bumps on his forehead, they're not massive yet, so he's not an old individual. Monkey's alarm calling. Eh? Yes. Monkey's alarm calling. Lori, you wondering why he's drooling? So sorry, Laurie, I was just, just give me two seconds before I answer that. I was just listening because there was a monkey that alarm called once and earlier I thought I heard an impala alarm call too. So I'm just listening out carefully, but we'll get into your question. You're wondering why he's drooling. It could be a number of things. Um, he could be salivating due to it being quite hot and he's kind of been mouth open. Also could have been chewing on some sort of a food item. Sometimes they'll chew on bones or uh, monkey oranges or wild calabashes and they then sometimes secrete an extra amount of saliva out of that. Um, those are what I would think is probable. Um, I don't think it's any sort of sign of him being unhealthy. He is a little bit on the skinny side, but that's to be expected at this time of the year where in the winter months and the browsing animals don't do that well in the winter. You can see he's also got a lot of ox peckers on him, which is great news for him because that means he's going to be kept nice and clean and his parasite load will be th will be less. You can see he's a little on the thin side and there's all those parasites I was talking about. Look at all the ticks underneath the tail there, those black dots that you're seeing are all ticks. And so the ox peckers are vitally important. He's actually not too bad on the inside of his legs. That's generally where you see a lot of them. But he's actually not too bad there, down the legs. few on the front legs. You can see those black sort of markings on the front legs. And actually you can see why he's walking gingerly. You look on the bottom left of that leg. You can see there is a, a wound there. Now I'm not sure what's caused that wound. But that's it's healing up and you'll be okay. But that's maybe why he's just a little ginger at the moment when walking. It's interesting, these monkeys are not alarm calling heavily. Christy, you're wondering if, if a giraffe fights and falls down, can they experience permanent damage? Christy, I've never seen it myself. I suppose it is possible. I suppose they could hit each other at an awkward angle and cause some sort of brain damage or potentially break a neck or do something like that or break a leg maybe. So that could be a, a situation that would happen. But of all the fights I've seen, even if they've knocked each other out, they get back up again. So it's very seldom that they're going to do permanent damage to each other. I suppose if they do hit themselves hard enough, there could be some damage done. Um, particularly the ribs and things like that they might crack the ribs but they still manage to get up and move animals are very 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 hardy they're much hardy than us as people they are able to survive in in sometimes the most harsh conditions and even with really bad injuries um, and I, I believe this Inkahuma female lioness has got a horrific injury on her hip it looks as though she's had a really nasty fight with somebody in the Kruger National Park because remember they went in there and then they were seen the next day coming out of the Kruger Park with a nasty gash so it does happen and they will and they will sometimes survive from that I remember seeing a cheetah in this area that was attacked by lions and she was cut from her front legs to her back legs across her abdomen and that abdomen actually looked as though you could actually see her ribs and the tendons and ligaments around the ribs and she survived so you know even if there's a bit of a broken rib or a broken leg or something like that sometimes if they can just stay away from other predators they generally can be okay now there is another car coming behind me I just want to put this in cow coloring here but it's not lots but maybe just check the Mulawati you all right cool cheers guys so I was just telling tax that there are monkeys alarm calling generally in this area for him to have a little look quickly and to maybe see if he can find what's causing those monkeys to be a little bit on 
the upset side. Maybe it's a bird of prey. Sometimes you will find monkeys alarm calling for things like crowned eagles, which would be a really amazing thing to see here. I didn't do it. The ticks most certainly can make the giraffe sick. If there's too many ticks, the giraffe definitely can get very sick from that. So they have to be a bit careful. They have to watch what's going on. They have to make sure that they are constantly trying to walk over bushes, scraping ticks off, allow those oxpeckers to feed off the parasites and keep them in good condition. You'll find a lot of the giraffe that have leg injuries tend to have a very high tick count. I remember there was a giraffe at Simomili that had a very bad front leg. And over time, she just got overrun by ticks and eventually she was found dead. And it was because of the ticks, they eventually basically poisoned her. Too much Staphylococcus in their mouth parts that caused her to basically get an infection and die. So it really is not a pleasant thing to think about, but that is exactly what happened, unfortunately. But beautiful individual nonetheless. And you can see the flies and the oxpeckers are driving him crazy. I can tell you the flies are really bad today. They're far worse than I've seen them in a long time. There might also be a little wound somewhere there on the back that those oxpeckers are pecking at because you can see they're all clustered together and that's where he keeps moving his neck and trying to chase them. So there we go. There's tracks for a male leopard in the Mulawati that Taxon has picked up going southwards. So I think those are the same reason that these monkeys are alarm calling. Let's maybe just turn and go and check back towards Twin Dams. Maybe our leopard is on its way to Twin Dams and we find it. It would be fantastic if we did. Like I say, I'm playing the alphabet game in the hope that L rewards me with the leopard. Even though I am enjoying the fact that we're looking at all different species and spectrums of life. H for Hosanna. That, fair enough. I think perfect. H for Hosanna. T for Tamba. And X for Shongile. That will be all three of them together lying on Twin Dam's wall. Thank you. We'll have that for later. That's perfect. We'll put that in the ordering and, and hope that that comes to fruition. I really want to see Shongile again. I know there's lots of you that are dying to see her and I, I really can't give you an update on her. I've asked around. No one's seen her. No one knows where she is. So I'm hoping that she's somewhere in this area and hopefully she will be seen. I'm just listening to text. Oh, there's Hornbill. Don't fly, don't fly. There we go. No. So yellow-billed Hornbill. There's H for us. Beautiful example of a Hornbill sitting nicely on top of an open branch. You don't often get them sitting so close, so really nice. And look at that yellow beak in that bright golden light. Isn't that beautiful? And those big eyes and big beaks that they use to be able to tussle with rather large prey items. You'll find hornbills, particularly the yellow-billed hornbill, will go after all kinds of different thing. But it has flown away now. And I was saying they go after all kinds of things. I actually you see them sometimes in the rest camps in Kruger where people will have barbecues and brais and food and you see them actually going after whole pieces of steak and so they are quite ferocious when they want to. These are fork-tailed drunger. You see, they all come out now. Once you've got the letter, they all start coming out. What are we now on? We are on HI impalas. There must be impalas right here. And I've got J already as well, which is quite easy. Where's I? There was impalas right here two minutes ago. It's amazing though. Yeah, we've just driven this road and there was impalas on both sides of the road, right where I am now. Not one impala left yet. So I don't know if they've gone down into the Mulawati or if they've shifted, they've shifted a little bit. Maybe they've come down to... Oh, there they are. So there's our impalas for I in front of us. So we'll just quickly go forward. We obviously have spent a bit of time with impalas already this afternoon. There's our impala just walking past us, going down towards. So, they just slowly moving southwards towards the dam. But Taxon says to me the tracks for that leopard are coming this side, towards Twin Dams. So I wonder if it's not this individual. 
Maybe we get lucky. Maybe this leopard is still here. There's impart I mean, the monkeys weren't alarm calling heavily, so it's difficult. You know, when they see a leopard, they generally go crazy, but they weren't alarm calling too much. So I'm going to just see if maybe there's something popping out this side. Um, no tracks that I can see this side. No. I wonder. Maybe, because Tax tells me he had tracks, like I say, coming straight towards where we are now. So it's difficult to to know exactly where he's gone. There's nothing that's coming out that I can see anywhere here. There's hyena tracks going southwards, but no sign of a leopard. I just want to quickly chat to Tax and just see what he says. Those are my Konzo Madala. Those tracks, they're old. Okay. Uh, Tamba. Tamba. Uh, okay. Cool. All right. I might do. I'll do the fire break and go on um, Leadwood. Check that side just in case. Okay. Cool. I'll do Leadwood and then come back around on uh, Mamba. Yeah. All right. Cool. Okay. Thanks. Cheers, guys. So I was just quickly chatting to Tax about it and he says they had Tumba last night here at Twin Dams and so these must be his tracks that they're talking about but what Tax told me is that Tumba came from the east crossed the drainage line to the I mean from the west crossed the drainage line to the east and these tracks are coming the opposite way so maybe he's here somewhere and I really hope so I'm desperate to see our little Tumba I haven't seen him and as we all know He's my favorite young leopard, so I'm really hoping we do. Uh, what letter are we on now? I, J, J, here's J right here. We can use this for J, Jackalberry, and probably one of the best examples of a Jackalberry in the whole of Juma. It is a beautiful big Jackalberry, this particular individual. Chris Rogue, you said a jackal. I'm um, just trying to think where I'd find a jackal. The best place for a jackal would be Chitwa Airstrip, although that jackal, I think, is a little bit on the mangy side from what I've heard. But we'll go and have a look. Maybe we'll get lucky with a jackal there. But I've got renewed energy and vigor now because if little Tumba is here, I will be very happy if I can find him. But that's a beautiful example of a tree, isn't it? It's, imagine what that tree has seen being here at Twin Dams all its life. The amount of lion and leopard and wild dogs and elephants and varying other species of animals that have crossed paths here, gone down to the water. It is an amazing thing to see. Very cool. I actually just want to quickly check somewhere because I remember when we had Tumba at Twin Dams the one day that we saw him go to a part of this area that's very difficult to negotiate. Remember when he went and said, were you with me when he lay on this wall? Yes, let's go check there quickly. Maybe he's lying there because that's where his tracks go. And I remember he did once lie in this general vicinity. Because L is next letter, isn't it? K first. K first, sorry. Maybe it's back to school for me. What do you think, Seb? Now, Megan, you said something, but I didn't quite hear it. Something about revolving leopards. I didn't exactly pick up what you said. Ah, there we go. So, Megs wants to give me a slight breather. So, we're going to actually go to a little clip about leopards as I talk about L and I look for Tumba in this little section. So, we'll see you in a little bit. Three magnificent leopards call our piece of wilderness home. Karula, Tingana, and Shadow. One of our favorite characters is Karula. She is a 12-year-old leopardess who defines success as a mother and as a huntress. Karula has raised eight cubs to independence and in February 2016, gave birth to another litter. Guys, Karula has brought her cubs to Juma. We've been tracking her. Look at the little guy. We just came around the corner. We're just gonna keep very still. Isn't this amazing? Oh my goodness, isn't this exciting? It has been a privilege and a joy to watch these two little cubs go from helpless furballs to perfect adolescent leopards. 
Their father, Tingana, is a nine-year-old male. This imposing prince of cats is the dominant male leopard of our area and the father of Karula's new cubs. Shadow, at nine years old, is Karula's oldest daughter and her story is far more tragedy than it is triumph. Unlike her mother, Shadow has yet to raise a cub to independence. There could be many reasons for this, ranging from hormonal imbalances to just plain bad luck. Her latest cub, a little female, was born in March 2016. We met this young leopard only twice before Shadow was seen mating again with Tingana. It is almost certain, therefore, that the new cub is dead. <laughs> Now, as much as, as much as those clips are a reminder of the incredible of the incredible sightings that we had of both Shadow and that cub and Karula and the two young royals, a little bit of sadness that kind of creeps in when you think of Karula's name and you kind of remember these these times that you had with her and how privileged we were to watch her and these little royal cubs grow up and become these adult, well, these independent leopards that have done so well, it really is quite amazing. And, and then for Shadow to have lost that cub and now to have had another one and to, to be involved with that cub and to have done so well to get to the cub to where it is now, you know, that cub is approaching slowly but surely getting to that magic kind of figure of a year old when generally they do a lot better. So it's, you know, in a way those clips sometimes are a little bit sad, but it is also such a reminder of where Hosanna and Shongile and have come from and how well they've done to be where they are and how there's a little bit of Karula in all of them that has allowed them to be the survivors that they are. So it's a wonderful thing to see and hopefully we can find any one of those leopards that were just shown. Now I would love to see Shongile, like I said, or Hosanna, Shadow, all of them. I, they're all firm favorites. and and animals that I love to spend time around. And we know that I'm a little bit crazy with leopards and love leopards as much as probably anybody else. So it'd be nice to catch up with any one of them. But lots of tracks for Tumba in this section, but they look like the ones from last night because a few vehicles have gone over them. So he must be here. And given that those monkeys made that little alarm call maybe they just saw him lying down in a thicket somewhere and that's why they gave a sort of two or three half-hearted alarm calls as they saw that he was resting although generally monkeys don't do that monkeys when they see a leopard go crazy and try and get that leopard away from them now I'm also just checking very carefully on this side on the southern side of Gauri Main because we know Tamba has spent a lot of time here in this particular section so I'm sure he's around we just need to find him but there's no tracks on Gauri Main for him going over they must still be around so I'm gonna keep with what I said to tax is that I'm gonna go on Ledwood Road and try and check to see if there's nothing on Ledwood or Mamba and then come back towards the Muluati maybe by then we get lucky and he's come out towards Twin Dams for a drink. It is hot, it's dry, it's the perfect conditions for a leopard to go for a drink in that this late afternoon golden light. So we're going to rely on that a little bit. What are we on now? K, 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 K. Uh, okay, K is quite easy. There's lots of those around that I can use. So there's Knobthorn just on any side of the road, Seb. There's lots of those either side if you want to use them. Kudu would be another one that we could use, but there is a Knobthorn, any of those big ones, basically. So there's a Knobthorn there. That one is no longer in flower. I think the one to the left there might be a better one for flowering, at least. It's got a few flowers on it, Seb. Yeah, that one. So you can see a little bit of kind of a yellow tinge or mustardy color. And those are the last of the flowers for the Knobthorns. They're one of the first plants to flower in the winter sort of season. In fact, I suppose you could call them a winter flowering plant. They're not really a summer flowering plant. They've all kind of finished flowering and there's still a few of those creamy yellow colors, um, flowers, should I say, that are left on the tree itself. And those are all ones that are just too tall for any of the animals to reach because giraffe, elephants, any of the antelope species absolutely love those nectar-rich flowers. 
and those are just unfortunately way up high that they can't be reached. Beautiful tree though. Well it is now Siteb, here we go. Spotted cats, we're going to find one now, I have a good feeling. I'm going to find a leopard somewhere. Of course if we don't find a leopard, I am on Ledwood Road, does that count Megan? No, is it only leopard? Is that the only L we can use today? No, because we said we won't use dams or roads. No, we said we won't use we won't use roads or dams or anything like that. So L is not what we can use. We're going to try and look for a leopard, but otherwise there's also lots of other L's. There's you know leadwood trees. There's um, leopard tortoise. There's uh, What's that? Legavan, which is the Afrikaans name for a monitor lizard. Uh, what else? Birdwise, lilac breasted roller. There's her. Debbie, you say lilac breasted roller. Giant land snail. Well, I suppose land snail would be pushing it a little bit. And there's not really many of those around. I just saw a shell for one. Ola, lapwing. That's a good one too, that's a fairly easy one, we should be able to find that. Uh, Lapid Face Vulture is another one. Um, what else? There's lots of L's actually, L's not too difficult, we should find L. I just want it to be a leopard just because it would be cool. We've got to have, we've got to have one of our letters being something, or a lion. <laughs> see, you see my brain doesn't work very well, I'm so besotted with leopards that I didn't even think of lion at all whatsoever. It's also probably because I know that there's no lions around that or even tracks and generally it's very seldom that you're gonna find a lion in late afternoon like this. They they are animals that are move generally in the sort of cooler parts of the day so that's normally around sunset and through the night and then sunrise they tend to settle particularly on warm days like we've had today. could use L for a log. That's pushing it, I think, as well. Lark, Roshni, that's a nice one. I like that one, actually. Wouldn't mind seeing a couple of larks. Best place for that would probably be Impala Plains. That wouldn't be a bad place to check for them. We can find the various species of larks and pipits there. I wonder when the monotonous larks are going to arrive this year. Talking about migratory birds and L for lark. The monotonous larks were such a big part of our late summer this year. We had just an influx of them and I remember it all started with James. He was in this magic cheetah sighting on Cheetah Plains where they had the rainbow. Remember when the two cheetah brothers were split and there was this rainbow and James was sitting there and he was just marveling at this beautiful sighting and he heard the sound that he recognized and couldn't put his finger on it and he kind of went through all of his books and eventually he got to monotonous lark and then from there they just overran the whole of cheetah plains juma it was just non-stop you'd hear them all the way through the night in the mornings the afternoons heat of the day it didn't matter the monotonous lark was going L, L, L. What else can I do for L? I'm just trying to look around me what there is that could be an L while I'm busy moving along because I want to try to keep the alphabet game ticking as we go and Ledwoods generally won't be too many of them up this side given that we are up on a crest so Ledwoods don't do that well here. They need quite a bit of water. Most of your hard wooded trees are generally close-ish to water. They like water a lot of them although there should be one or two leadwoods up the side I think I've seen some mostly marulas though marulas love this section I was reading an article the other day there's a guy that's busy doing a study funny enough talking about marulas and um, he's studying the area that we're in so basically from here to this through Skakuza region down to the southeast of the Kruger Park there is a belt of marulas I see there's a Batalia eagle I'm just wondering if the road goes a bit closer Seb maybe not it won't actually let's try to do it from here so there's a beautiful Batalia eagle in the tree and while we are looking for elves we might as well just take the moment to appreciate its beauty because it is a wonderful 
bird. Is it a battalier? Yes, it is. It's a young battalier. I wonder if it's the same one that flew away from us earlier. It's a very similar coloration. Still that caramel brown around the throat and in the darker back. And you can see battalier, even if you couldn't see its head, just those wings, the way they end and almost crisscross at the base there is a perfect indication of battalier and very round, robust head. And obviously then the coloration and even just the shape of it is very little else that it could be. There's a telltale beak, quite slender, comparative to other birds of prey we get out here. Very easy to tell. Now this one I'm sure is from the nest that we have between Battalier and Ledwood Road. There's a nest that we get here. I'm sure that's where that particular bird comes from. Beautiful though, enjoying some afternoon light. So they will mostly feed off carrion. You'll find that they're not an birds that use this, the thermals to soar heavily, even though they will a little bit. Most of their flying is, is done quite low to the ground where they can spot various fresh carcasses and then come down and feed off it. So they're a carrion feeder more than anything else. Lorena, you say they are such cool birds. They are beautiful, aren't they? I, I like the adults a lot. Those colors are just amazing. It's probably got to be one of the most colorful birds of prey anywhere in the world. And with those red and yellows and bright red legs and that big puffy head. And it's like jet black that just glares slightly when you kind of get close to them. There's a little bit of that reflection of light. It is very pretty. We're actually going to get quite close to him. So I thought he might fly away or she it's difficult to say if it's a male or female yet i thought it might fly away but now that we're here it's actually staying still and it's we are very close to it which is beautiful so we should get a nice full glimpse of it there we go now what is amazing with this bird is that even though it's still brown like this it's going to take it seven years to go from brown to those beautiful rich colors i was talking about just now now seven years is a long time given that this bird only probably lives to about 20 years in captivity so it's almost a third of its life is spent in a juvenile or immature phase now imagine if that was humans it would mean that the first sort of 30 years of your life you would still be considered a teenager which is quite crazy to think so they have a long period of baiting to grow up and it's part of the reason why their numbers have declined a little bit in South Africa because of again what we're talking about with vultures and and these guys being carrion feeders they often are poisoned and so because there's a huge poisoning of adults the juveniles take so long till they can breed that once you get rid of too many of the adults the breeding population is then destroyed and so things get well decline very very quickly so it's a an amazing kind of thing and, and a bad thing in a way because it leads to the sort of numbers declining outside of protected areas like this as you travel northwards in Africa there's still lots of them but here in South Africa really only the Kruger Park houses a massive population outside of that there's the odd birds here and there and then again in the Kalahari there's a couple that side as well I suppose quite a lot actually in the Kalahari but those two game reserves really form the bulk of the population within South Africa Although I saw one was seen in Cape Town fairly recently, which is fairly crazy. Don't know what it was doing all the way down there. Must have got blown that way by some of the winds. Well, Batalia, have a nice afternoon. You look like you're in a superb spot for the afternoon watching the sunrise. You're going to have a most epic sunrise from here. You can see that's where the western horizon is and the Drakensberg Mountains are. Oh, I didn't think of that for D. The Drakensberg Mountains would have been a nice one. And so it's going to have the most spectacular view of the sunset. This is actually one of... I remember Brent, the first time I ever came onto Juma and did a drive with Brent, he was telling me this is his favorite section. He used to love driving along here and watching the sun set. So I hope Brent is well and enjoying the last few days of his holiday because he seems to have had an absolute blast. Him and Jamie have been all over the place. They were in Nairobi for a while, then they went to one of the most beautiful parts of the world called Lake Naivasha and that is really a very special place and he's been doing a little bit of fishing which will make Brent very happy. I'm sure Jamie's been relaxing and I know Jamie's also been trying to get into fishing with Brent so maybe she's done a bit with with him and they've I hope they've had some success and caught some nice things and seen some amazing stuff at Naivasha. It's a beautiful part of the world and sure he will be re-energized both of them when they come back to work. I'm looking forward to it I would imagine. I know Brent gets quite 
excited when he gets back to work. He's all over the show, likes to bounce around. It was nice the other day, I got to have a long chat to him because I haven't had too much chance to speak to him. We kind of keep missing each other. And the other day I had, well, we, I think we spoke for over an hour and we were just catching up on everything and it was really good to hear all his stories and hear how, you know, all the adventures they've gotten up to and it's just very good to catch up. It's, it's amazing how you miss friends when you haven't seen them for quite some time. Um, hyena tracks, not what I was hoping for. Hold on. Rusty, stop squeaking. I was just looking down the road. I thought I saw something walking in the road, but alas, I was being ever hopeful. It's all hyena tracks. Debbie, you say L for leaf. I suppose I could do that, but I feel like maybe that's just cheating a little bit. Let's try and get a leadwood tree. I mean, that's the easiest, going to be the easiest one for sure. They're not too, I mean, not too far apart. There will be some down closer towards the Mulawati that we can get fairly quickly. So we will use L for leadwood. In fact, it's going to be the, probably the easiest one. I'm just delaying it because I really want a leopard. That, that's really the truth. It's being a bit selfish. Sorry, guys. What else could we use for L? I'm just trying to think of other L's. Right. I'm going to try and check around a little bit more. But while I catch my breath quickly and take a sip of water, let's go and have a look at the beautiful little Princess Shongile and just how proficient a hunter she's starting to become. What you see? Oh, I see what she's seen. I think that's a bit too deep for you, Shongile. I saw what you saw. Oh, I hope you catch it. Come on, girlie. Come on, come on, come on. Here comes the jump. Oh, did she get it? She got it! Well done! <laughs> Good girl. Oh, it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a baby monitor lizard. So that's a better meal than a terrapin. I just saw a long tail flapping around. So it looks like it could be a baby monitor lizard. So I'll have a look there. You can see the tail hanging down from her mouth a little bit. Let's turn your head for us. Shongile, my darling, turn your head. Oh, not yet. There we go. And you can hear the impala going even, oh, there we go. Look at that tail whipping around. Yes, it's a monitor. It's a baby monitor. Well, if you want to find out what's happening in the middle of the African... Well, isn't that amazing how she started out with such little prey items. So we started her seeing her doing terrapins and then she graduated to a monitor lizard and it was really quite a profound moment that I remember Brent being so happy about it because obviously Shongile, he won't admit it, but it's his little favorite princess and a leopard he spent a lot of time around and he absolutely loved that sighting. Seeing her catching that monitor lizard was just when she, just after Karula had disappeared and you know, we were all a bit worried about her because she was much smaller than Osana. Osana seemed to have taken to that sort of solitary life like a duck to a pond and was very happy with doing his thing and finding food. But it seemed as though Shongile, you know, she looked as though she was struggling a little bit more and she was kind of terrapins and that was the first kind of active kill that she got and it was really a big moment. I was super happy when she caught that. I remember actually being here during that well, was actually, I was on leave, I think, at that time. And now she's progressed. Now we've seen her with Daika kills. We've seen her with, or heard of her with Impala kills. So she really has done quite well. But I'm not sure there's a leopard around here. There's so many Impalas and so many different species of antelope here that if Tumba is here, he's definitely keeping a very, very, very low profile. So I'm going to go north in the Mulawati just to check. But here his tracks are here, I think. Going southwards, are these them? Yes, here they are. See, they're going southwards. So these are the tracks that they had. So he must be here, and these are on top of all the vehicle tracks. 
So I would imagine he's somewhere close by, we just got to find him. But while we're getting our alphabet game going, and I said I'll try and find a Ledward, there's about a hundred of them where I am now. There's one big one just here on my left hand side, which is a beautiful example of a Ledward. And this is an area that Tandi and Tumba both spend a lot of time. I've tracked them both here three, four times in this general vicinity. And under these big shady Ledwoods is the perfect place for a leopard to sit and relax and spend the afternoon, in, especially a hot afternoon like today. The Mulawati is perfect. We will find this leopard. He is here somewhere. These tracks are from during the day today. So he is around. Just a matter of seeking him out. So that, as I was saying earlier, that's one of our third well it's our third densest tree that we have out here so it will not float in wood not a wood you would want to build a boat out of also if you did try build a boat out of it especially by hand you would probably take all your life to chop that up that wood is ridiculously hard it's amazing actually how hard it is so not a good idea at all one because you'll sink and two because it will take you all your life just to sink which seems a bit pointless doesn't it okay what's after L M M is also easy, but we can do a marula for M. Where's a marula? There must be a marula close by. Marianne, you suggest mongoose? Well, before we do M, let's just do N because N is staring at us right in the face. There's a nyala right in front of us, so we might as well just do that quickly. While it's here, I can also see marulas way in the distance, so we could potentially show an M, but let's do N before it runs away. Isn't that a magical scene, though? This is why... Scott, Brent, James, myself, Jamie, pretty much all of us, this is one of our favorite places to be because look at that. Big bull Nyala in the Mulawati riverbed, big tall old trees that have been here for years and the banks of the river that are lush and green in this dryness. It is very pretty to be in here and it's just something about it, especially when the sun's starting to go down, you get this dappled light that comes through the trees and these sort of rays and fingers and it's just very pleasant. The only problem is it tends to be quite warm because you don't get much of a breeze. Isn't that the most stately looking Nyala? He's definitely posing as best he can. He's got his beard all combed nicely. He's got his back fur is down so he's not all puffy. And he's just standing there and giving his best angle really. Something's catching his attention though. They generally are a little bit more nervous. But this is a prime, prime, prime example of why their camouflage works so well. Remember that male Nyala spend a lot of time on their own. They don't spend much time in groupings together. And if you look at his camouflage, look at the darkness. If we come back a bit, Siv, just so I can show you. So if we come back, look at how the dark matches the darkness of those tree trunks. And then those light legs perfectly fit into the grass. So the white gives it away a little bit for us. But if you can imagine dappled light, and then see how well that animal actually blends in. So those legs are perfectly designed. They are in a way that there's not dark brown because they would stand out in that light colored grass and then the dark brown body is perfect for these thicker dense areas so they do blend in incredibly well. I mean he's right out in the open and he still blends in from here but something's caught his attention. He's a bit twitchy isn't he? He's kind of looking and there's a little bit of a twitch in those shoulders Maybe some of the flies that were bugging the giraffe are also bugging him. But the ears are focused. He's not in any way looking at us, which is quite strange. Nyala tend to be quite aware of their surroundings. And when they see us, they tend to move away and try and slink off into some sort of a thicket. But this guy is really focused and he's sniffing and smelling. If, of course, he saw a leopard and he could base blatantly see it, he would alarm call, which would sound like a dog barking. And he's not doing that. So it might just be something that he's not sure about. Ooh, what's that flying over there? You can hear the birds are alarm calling. There's a excipiter that's just flown away from us, which we won't be able to get on camera. But for those of you that are not sure what an excipiter is, is a small predatory bird like goshawks, sparrowhawks, those kind of birds. Let's try to get a little bit closer and just see what he's staring at. Maybe he'll allow us to get even closer and we can get some beautiful visuals of his face because they have great markings on their face. There he goes. I didn't do it. You're wondering if their stripes fade as they get older. Well, in the males, yes. In the females, not so much. The females tend to have still quite big, bright white stripes as they get older. 
Um, males, not so much. There's definitely get less. But look how he's sniffing. I wonder if he didn't see that leopard at some stage during the day today and is still a little bit wary. Nose is going. He's ambling off away from us. But they are the most exotic looking, I think, of our animals. Our, it's definitely our antelope out here with those browns and whites. It's absolutely beautiful. And there we go into the thicket and will just disappear like a ghost. Amazing, isn't it? Imagine trying to spot that now if he stood still. It would be really difficult. Well done, Seb. Let's go slowly up here anyway and check. Mr. P, you're wondering if Nyala can run fast because they look quite heavy. Well, Mr. P, they're not the most at athletic of antelope species out here, so we definitely have more athletic antelopes in the form of impalas and dike and steenbok and those the likes. So they're not nearly as fast. They probably run at about top speed, about 60 kilometers an hour. Um, so I'm not sure what that is in miles. It would be... This is where our leopard came from, though. He walked down like this. Um, that would be, what, 30... No, 60 kilometers, about 20... 5, 20, no more, more, sorry, I lie, it's more than that, it's close to 40 miles an hour, if I'm correct, somewhere around there, I don't know, like I say, maths is not my strong point, but it's somewhere in that general vicinity, and so they're not the most agile in terms of speed, but they can turn and twist and negotiate these thickets very well, and they can use that to their advantage, and then obviously their camouflage is a huge defensive mechanism for them. So I'm going to go back down towards Twin Dams to see if maybe Tumba has arrived there now. If he's not there, then I'm going to go to Chitwa Dam just to enjoy the last little bit of light that will be on Chitwa Dam and see if there's anything lurking in that area. And then we'll come back via Twin Dams and see if this leopard is out and about because he must be here somewhere. Okay, but now what are we on? O now. O? Uh, no? We've done, no, M is Marulas, but there's Marulas spread all the way around here so M is not too bad and um, we can pretty much count them those are all those big trees in the distance are marula trees and um, M N is yeah O is next where's our giraffe where we need it because we need ox peckers yeah. we've seen lots of ox peckers apparently there was a giraffe on the down camp 20 minutes ago I wonder if it was our friend we must have walked quite briskly to get there 20 minutes ago I'm sure Tumba's here I've got this feeling that he's here I've just got to find him I know he likes to spend time all along this area right up against the thickets and because he's a young individual he likes to hide away a little bit so I'm sure he's here if he's not here now with the spotlight we will find him he's go to go to water at some point Oriel, I like that, Kimmy. That's actually probably a very nice one. And where we are is a good place for them. They like this section. They like the thickets of the Mulawati, and you get that gold flash as they fly past you. So this is a really good place for Orioles. So apparently his tracks crossed over some... Well, not crossed over, but we're coming in this direction. I wonder if he didn't go down off Elephant Carcass into this thicket. Because it would be easy to see him on this bank. Don't see any tracks though. Problem is, is that if he's gone off elephant carcass, it's so open and, I mean, so thick and dense in there, it's very difficult to see a leopard. You're going to have to just rely on alarm calls or him walking and then spotting him as he walks. I'm just relying on the fact that it's been hot and hopefully he's going to go for water because that's how we would, without being able to track him, find him. Oh, for a second there I thought it was a leopard but it's just a tree. You see it's at the base there on that muddy section. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so it looks, it's our leopard leaf that is there. If you look where Seb is going to zoom in now, 
right there, that little clump at the bottom. I thought for a second that right there, I thought for a second it might be because you often see little sort of signs of them <laughs> like that. <laughs> Let's say you say I must channel my inner leopards. Well, it's being channeled. I'm channeling it as best I can. And hopefully it's going to work out for us. I'm hoping there's going to be a leopard here somewhere. Just trying to listen. Some of the things been found on the radio, but I don't know. I think it's in Buffalo's Hook. Can't hear anything outside. There's some Franklin's alarm calling down in the Milwaukee though. Or here at the dam. Maybe they're just calling because it's sunset time. What are you complaining about? It's an Atoll Franklin that's busy moaning. There it is. So sometimes they'll make this noise when they see a predator. but I don't see any sign of anything. There's also one behind me that's also alarm calling. Tumbo, are you drinking at Twin Dams and I just can't see you? I wonder if he hasn't come past you and caused a little ruckus. Don't see any sign. There's also no sign of any of the antelopes that were here earlier. Let's just look carefully. He said maybe we get lucky here. I know he likes. There's a termite mound on the other side that he's been seen a few times on. He's not there today though. Not in the Mulawati by the looks of it. Hmm, seems as though those Franklins are just doing their territorial call, their last call for the day before they bed down for the night. They're not alarm calling at anything that I can see unless maybe a bird of prey flew over. Now, I was talking about Tumba and we've been looking for him but let's quickly have a little look at how inquisitive he can be when there are the great, big grey pachyderms around. Look, look at this. This is so cool. We can have elephants and leopard in the same sighting. Wow. You can't stalk an elephant, you silly cat. Wow. How cool is that? That's echo. Epic, epic, epic. Our little boy is watching the ellies. So he's not far, but I think he would prefer to be in a little bit of cover when he watches and he's seeing the ellies. The ellies are having a little suckling session in the background there. So everybody's really quite chilled. Now, this elephant is going to get closer for sure. It's walking right on the edge and little Tumba, you're going to have to move. Now the elephant's just seen him. But you can see the elephant's reaction to a leopard it's going to come closer but it's not really going to worry too much about Tumba. Well, wasn't that an amazing sighting? I remember that very clearly. It was last time I last cycle and it was the most epic few days with that little leopard. We had such a good time and watching him with those elephants was quite interesting. He was that's <laughs> very curious and very naughty. He kind of went close to them and then he would sort of lose his nerve and run off and then he was interested again and he ended up being stuck right in the middle of that whole big grouping. It can't have been very comfortable for him and he got pushed around from pillar to post a little bit but it was really cool to watch and then that afternoon his rest didn't kind of come to him because that was when Tingana chased him that afternoon as well so he had a rough day that day but he's all right. He, seems to be doing just fine although I haven't seen him for quite some time apparently he was seen quite a bit when I went on leave last I think you, you and Byron saw him didn't you Seb? Yeah, yeah, yeah. he did eh? so he was around apparently somewhere on Gary Main and then since then I haven't seen him but what I do know about Tumba is generally when he is in an area he tends to spend quite a few days around there and you tend to get quite a few sightings of him 
and so maybe we'll get lucky and he will come out at twin dams and then you know hopefully he sticks around for a couple of days and we can get some really nice time spent with him because he is a beautiful beautiful animal but we're heading to Chitwa quickly while the sun's still up to see what's happening at the dam Kristen, you're wondering if Tumba has had any successful kills that I know of. Uh, no, I haven't. I haven't heard of him having any of his own kills, or in fact, killing anything by himself. It's not to say that he hasn't. Remember that he doesn't hasn't spent as much time on Juma as he has anywhere else. So now that he's starting to spend more time, I would imagine we will see him with a kill from time to time. The thing is also, is Tundi is an incredibly efficient hunter, and she tends to come up with the goods more often then not and so I think he relies quite heavily on her but now that she's spending long periods away from him I would imagine that he does find what he needs um, on his own and he, he probably find he's going after small things like Franklins and and birds and small rodents he might even go after things like cane rats which is a fairly good meal for a leopard a cane rat is much bigger than you would think they're about that large so they really are big big rats and quite rounded. What is that walking over there? Oh, waterbuck. So there's some waterbuck. There's a crowned lapwings in front of me. Yes, yes, yes. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But let's see. Our waterbuck are always so beautiful. I wonder if we can get this guy. Oh, no. Seb, I don't know if you can maybe try. It's going to be tough. There's a spider hunting wasp that is just coming past me now. <laughs> there it goes again. So it's just buzzing around my head. There's a massive spider hunting wasp that has now drifted off. It was flying around the termite mound, so I was wondering if it was maybe going to try go in and look for some spiders inside there. You can see every now and then it just buzzes through the frame. Big blue wasp. We need that for W. Still on O, so we need ox peckers, but it's getting late for ox peckers. It's going to be quite, quite tough. There's lots of water buck. Let me go forward though for you. And I've got to say, young water buck are some of my favorite. They're the most fluffy things out here. <laughs> you say ocelot? Well, unfortunately, no ocelots here in South Africa or in the Sabi Sands, at least. There is none that are occurring naturally, so we won't be able to do ocelot. Otter would be quite a cool one. Not that there are many otters in this particular section. Down in the Sabi River, we might find them, or the Sand River, but not up here, unfortunately. But otter would be a very cool one. Ostrich would be another cool one to have which has been seen at Chitwa Open. Maybe we get lucky at Chitwa Dam with an ostrich. These guys are so beautiful and fluffy. You can see little male there with his horns just starting to come out of his head. So he's going to get big one day and have massive sets of horns and he's going to try and dominate. And this is the size that Tingana likes to go after. I've seen him with countless waterbuck of that size, which is pretty incredible. I mean, it's not a small antelope, but he goes after them fairly regularly. I've seen Tundi go after them quite often. So even when they get that size and, and are sort of seven, eight months old, that's still fair game to a lot of our leopards out here. But they are beautiful. And as the name suggests, close to water. Water is not far away. Chitwa Dam is just down the hill. So they very close to where water would be used to evade predators although going into that water would be a massive mistake because that water is full of things you do not want to go into there is crocodiles that are going to get you if you go in there and so for a water buck not the best water hole to try and cross should you be being chased by leopard or lions or wild dogs or any other predator really but let's quickly go down to Chitwa Dam while there's just a little bit of light because that light is starting to disappear quite quickly. So I want to try and get down there as fast as possible. Paula, the waterbuck young ones do smell the same as the older ones do. Not as pungent, but they do have a smell to them. And that's because it's that oil that is secreted to help with the waterproofing of the coat. So even though it's, um, it, is, um, it is stinky, and, and, but they both need it, even when they're young, they're still going to use water to escape predation. Sure, Chitwa Dam has dried quite a bit since I last saw it. There's our little dwarf mongoose. Are you guys going to stay for us? Please stay. I know you're not O, but we can use you for something else if we want to. M, you can see a couple of them just 
between the root system. I really like these dwarf mongoose. They're super cute. And look how curious they are. See, it's coming closer to come say hello. And that looks like a fairly young one. It's a little sniff of the branch. Now, half of them are on my right-hand side and the other half on the left. So everybody's kind of just checking out which way is the safest way to go and sizing us up and making sure we're not something to worry about. But that is a young... Oh, little itch as well. You can actually hear them all around us making little contact calls. It's really cool to hear them just calling and talking to each other. That is as good as it gets when it comes to seeing a dwarf mongoose. It's about as close. Are you going to climb a tree for us? No, nope, you're smelling what's there. Something's caught the scent, but look at the little claws that they use to dig. It's not every day we get to see those claws. How cool is that? And this little one is really coming right out into the open. You can see they're sniffing around. There's a scent of something that's what have you got there? Wow, that is so cool. It's not every day we're going to get to see dwarf mongoose this close and this relaxed. Oh, and off we go. No, decided. I'm done with my stick. Down into the ground I go. And you can see them all bounding along and running along in the grass. <laughs> so much attitude and so much fun amongst this grouping. Dapper mongoose, they're not really aggressive, especially not these dwarf mongoose. They're so little, they're super scared of us. So if we come close, they're just going to run away. They're not wanting to have anything to do with us. We're very nervous. But if they get rabid mongoose, so white-tailed mongoose are quite big, and if they go rabid, they can be a little bit of a handful. But generally, no. Most of the mongoose are fairly sort of relaxed and, and fairly wary of people. They see people coming, and they try and move off. Now, said before the sun sets, maybe if we can just get the sunset, because it's absolutely beautiful look at the cloud layer that we've got so we've got these streaky clouds there's blues there's oranges marula trees that is quintessential sabi sands sunsets look at that isn't that beautiful now we might have had a quiet afternoon with not too many animals but that is an exquisite sunset the clouds just add to it it's almost like somebody's taken a brush and just kind of painted those clouds in behind the trees it is wonderful and the sun is going to set in the next few minutes so we're not going to see too much more of that sun as it goes down big giant golden ball Jeff, you're wondering about the Juma heat, whether it's dry or if it's a humid heat. Well, this time of the year, because we haven't had the rains yet, it's still a dry heat, so it's a hot, dry feeling at the moment. But as soon as the rains come, then we go more humid. So once we have a bit of rain around, then we get a very humid heat. The humidity can go up to sort of 70, 80 percent on after rain, and sometimes even as much as 90 percent if we have lots of rain. So it does get quite humid out this side. But it's now at the moment is a very dry heat. There's no real sort of moisture around other than in these big dams that are up in front. And so very little chance to be able to actually... Is that the sun reflecting in the water there? That's amazing. A whole bunch of birds going over. I wonder what's lurking at Chitwa. I wonder what's lurking at Chitwa Dam. It doesn't look like much at the moment. There's definitely no big elephants, which I thought there might be. Louis, I prefer sunrise or sunset. Depends. Uh, this is a question that we get asked quite regularly, and, and I always kind of battle with it a little bit because I really like sunrise for when I'm working because it's the, it's the kind of dawn of. Kind of dawn of a new day unknown fresh tracks to work with lots of interesting things going on it's it's a kind of reset button has been pushed and you're out and you're looking and you're investigating and so i like that from a work point of view but sunset when you're off and you're with family and friends and you can kind of take it easy and just watch the sun go down is always very pleasant so it just depends on what i'm doing in terms of work i typically 
normally like sunrise. Now I've found our O for us, it's not an oxpecker, but it is the largest orchid that we get here in South Africa. So we've got a beautiful big leopard orchid that is in this tree. And this tree is quite cool because there's two things here. Sorry, so I'm not in gear. But there's our leopard orchid, and it's one of the larger leopard orchids that we get. And what you will immediately notice is that is a completely dead tree. So this plant is surviving completely on its own. It's not parasitizing the, the dead tree at all. It's living all by itself. And it's what's known as an epiphyte, which is a air plant. And so basically, it's absorbing moisture through the air, and it's basically self itself to get nutrients as well as will catch any other little bits of foliage that falls down. So you see how roots actually grow upwards. The roots don't grow down like a normal plant. Those roots are growing up and crisscrossing and that will trap leaf litter that blows in the wind as well as its own leaves that then cannibalizes and eats and that's how that plant survives. Now the leopard orchid name comes from a beautiful flower that comes out of this plant. It's got yellows and blacks on it and it really is a magnificent looking Ah, so apparently there's something right here because Peter's calling me with haste, which means he's got his camera out, so I think we're going to bump into a leopard. Would you imagine that? So Chitwa Dam might be a completely good call. I didn't, nobody gave me an update about anything here, so I think Peter might have just bumped into this right now. But <laughs> if it is a leopard, I'm going to be super happy, but I will laugh as well because, as well, because what are the chances that we come this way and there's a leopard here? The way he's photographing, it is a leopard. There's a leopard right there with a kill. Look at that. Yes. <laughs> it's a leopard with a kill. It looks like Hosanna. Scrub hair kill. Let's go, guys. How's that? <laughs> so, leopard magic continues. Nice. Sir. Well done. <laughs> so, I was coming to Chitwa Dam in the hope that we would see something, and I was kind of thinking maybe Hosanna would be around as well but how cool is this and he's just caught that scrub bear look you can see he's kind of just grabbed it it is definitely Hosanna now that I can see his eyes well done boy now we were talking earlier about how these royal cubs have really grown into incredible individuals that have learned how to hunt and to do their business that they need to do and look at that there he is with the kill right there for us how magic is that now I know our alphabet game is going but we are throwing that right out the window now because we're just going to sit with Hosanna for the remainder of the afternoon. This is so, so special. You little champion, well done. So Peter's celebrating over there and Peter's done a sterling effort for us. So we're giving Peter a longitudinal high five, which is a high five from far away. This is how we do it. And there he goes. Off he goes. Now I'm going to try and quickly just get round because I'm on a little ridge here, which is quite difficult to get into. And so I want to try and get to where he's going. Careful, Seb. It's going to be a bit of a bump down. But well done, Hosanna. You are really growing up into a fine young individual. You all right there, Seb? Good stuff. Oh, there we go. Big bump. And I'm so impressed with him. He's, you know, he's come such a long way in such a short time. As we were talking about earlier, he's he's really kind of learnt how to to do what he needs to do to find food and. We were talking earlier about timber and kills that he might have made. These kind of things are exactly what these guys go after regularly is scrub hares and birds and nobody's going to know, be any the wiser if he had caught this and we weren't here because he'll finish this by tomorrow morning no problem. He's no ways he's going to finish, I mean still have this by the morning so he'll be able to finish it and be eating it. And you'll find tomorrow morning will be on the move again. But Chitwa seems to become, have become his home, and I'm quite happy with that. If he's going to end up being the dominant male around Chitwa, well, we won't say no to that either. I think he's going to settle down. Oh, he's going to play with his scrub here. Look, is there still a... Jimmy, you say, yes, this is your favorite leopard. Well, Jimmy, I think you are not alone. There's many a person that loves Hosanna and is their favorite, so... 
I would imagine that you will be have good company and he is a beautiful individual so you see look how he's watching around because when he killed the scrubhead it would have made a bit of a noise so he's just making sure that nobody else is here no hyenas are around before he'll start to feed are you going to just check down down there Roshni you say our little chief isn't so little anymore and bravo well, exactly, Roshni. He's he's growing into a fine young fellow. Look at how beautiful he looks, and he's getting stockier by the day and bigger by the day. He is a beautiful, beautiful cat, and he's transcended from a cub to a sub-adult with absolute ease and, and, and skill. He's become one of our sort of leopards that we've seen with regular meals and regular carcasses, so he's done fantastically well and is an animal that has really taken to solitary life very 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 easily and it's amazing how well leopards actually can do it you, you know a lot of people would have heard of a, a leopard cub at 12 months going off on his own or it was just after 12 months and they would have thought he would have had a struggle but you can see by this that he's really done well i mean in the week that i've been back he's had a steenbok an impala and now a scrub here but he's going to disappear down the gully so i'm going to try and just go around isn't that awesome, Seb? Wow, so awesome. Peyton, you say Hosanna with the kill is an automatic victory to the alphabet game. Well, I, I think so. I think we've been very victorious in that we've been able to um, find a leopard on our afternoon. And literally, if Peter hadn't been here, we still would have found him because we were coming right to chit with them so I think we can give ourselves a pat on the back well Seb actually because Seb was the one that said Chitwa is where we need to go so Seb actually needs the credit more than what I do I agreed with him that Chitwa would be a nice place but he was saying we need to head to that way while we were watching one of the catch-up clips because he wanted a bit of the sunshine and so we're gonna give Seb this one and make it his find basically now I wonder if we're gonna keep up with him because he's going into a horrible horrible place but we'll try and keep up with him. He's, this is actually, funny enough, a place where I had a rather interesting altercation with Karula the one day. She almost ate me here. I ended up having to shout at her and try and keep her at bay. She was probably no less than a meter from me, growling and hissing. And it was because she was mating with Mvula and I had walked into her and she also had to kill up a tree that I couldn't see and one, I walked under the tree by mistake and she was on the other side and of this little drainage section that Hosanna went into and she wanted to eat me so it was not a very pleasant situation and one that I hopefully won't have to repeat any ever again. Now he's somewhere inside here. Hosanna, you've parked in a very bad place. I don't want to block Peter because he can't see. Seb, I'm going to try and go a little bit further back for you. And try and look up this drainage a little bit. I also have a very fond memory of this particular drainage line. And just to give you an idea of how much things have changed and how much it's dried up, I'm going to show you a picture shortly of what this looked like in 2012. So in 2012, this was a very different looking area and I'm going to show you exactly what it looked like in comparison to now so you guys can see just how much this drought has had a, an effect in this particular section I just gotta find the picture now so there we go right there's our dead scrub here now, hold on Sebs let me just quickly clean my screen because we've got little grubby paw prints all over it and my hands are a bit grubby from rusty steering right so this is Waba Yiza Tundi Sun on a kill sitting on the bank exactly on the other side there so right where we are now is straight across is where I had him on this kill so look at that lush green vegetation now then look what it looks like now now it is a straight across that is exactly where we had him is on that side it's eroded a little bit more but how's that very different so you can just see the extent of what's happened with the drought which is amazing. So it's it's a very different appearance to what it used to be. But Hosanna has now decided it's time to sleep on his kill. There you go. You can see he's now lying on top of his scrub here. What are you doing? You must eat it, not sleep on it. 
Vicky, you say, always seems to play with his food before eating it. He is a funny cat. I don't know why. I suppose it's a bit you. Sorry about that guys, it seems that we've got a little bit of interference here in Chitwe, we're behind the dam wall so it might be causing a bit of a problem, so he's sitting as dead still as we can, we've moved a little bit, but Hassan is now starting to play with his kill again, just like a young cat would, you can see he's picking it up and clawing at it, and kind of seeing if it's still alive, look at that, look at the size of his paws now, now he's going to lie there. It's a bit gruesome, so if you are a bit squeamish, it's now's the time to, to look away. Unfortunately, this is the best view we can get, because if I go back, I'm going to lose signal again. And this bank is not exactly stable, so I don't want to go any closer to the bank than what I currently am, because Rusty falling inside there is going to result in, well, a whole car in there on its side, and myself and Seb out with the leopard on a kill, which we don't really want. So we're going to stay where we are, and I'm sure he's going to play with it quite a bit, so he's going to move around and kind of mess around with it and poke at it and play with it and sort of do what young leopards do really and then eventually he'll tuck into it but he's got himself into a perfect place because down in here there's going to be no wind drifting onto hyenas and varying other predators so he can feed off that in peace. Ilana you're 14 years old and I hope you are having a wonderful day you want to know how old is Hosanna now. Well, Hosanna was a year old in March, so he's now 12th of March, I think it was. 12th of March or 12th of February? I always forget that wrong, but he's basically now March, April, May, June, July, August. Oh, months are going on quickly now, so he's he's now 19 months, I think, is about right. Am I right? 19 months? Is that right, Seb? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, a year and a half old let's call it that <laughs> so he's a year and a half old now so he's still a youngster he's no by no way a dominant individual yet by no way is he even a big male yet he's still growing it seems he's got one or two little bite marks on the back of his head so i wonder if he's had a bit of a run-in with tingana or somebody else you see there's a few little disturbances there so maybe he's had a little bit of a altercation with somebody he's absolutely fine otherwise he's not limping or anything but there is just a little bit of an indication that he's had some sort of struggle on the back of his head there and you can see his head is moving quite a bit it's because of all the flies look at the flies on his ears that are busy causing absolute havoc this is so cool leopard with a kill hippos in the background calling sun setting Joshua you say Osana you silly cat Look at this, this is what we're surrounded by. We've got that beauty 
above us. We've got the beautiful Hosanna below us playing with his kill. Hippos behind us that are calling. Fish eagles that have called. It's just, it is the most magical setting to be in. And what a way started out with the hopes of finding one of these individuals and we really have come right. So I think we, we'll just have to give some credit to Megan because Megan threw out the positive vibes by playing a catch-up clip of the Little Royals. So it, we were bound to then find one. We had to find one so is that we could relive it re in real time again with the Royals and one of them at least. Hopefully Shongile will be on the way home. Wouldn't that be spectacular? If only Hosanna would just move slightly, it would be really a little bit better for us. I'm just scared to move because, like I say, with the technique, with the signal issues, I don't really want the gremlins to take over again. So we'll wait for him. Also, we think it's going to round and move, and it'll be up and down all over the show. A little bit of an itchy neck. But that scrub here, once he does start eating, will be a quick feast. It's not going to last long. He'll crunch through that in a in an hour or two he's not gonna be here for all night but i wouldn't be surprised if tomorrow morning to try and sort of come down here and check because he might still be here in the morning okay i'm going to try and move megan says we're going to try it and let's see maybe um I just don't know where i'm going to go to because i also don't want to give him a fright because we are right on top of him I just don't want to give him any sort of reason to get a, a little bit of a sort of... Seb, you just tell me if you can see him from when we go here. No, nothing, eh? Will I be in the way if I move? Hold on. Grass in the way, plenty. Still. Let's see, it's difficult. I think Seb's battling because the grass is all in the way. You can see there he's behind quite a thick bank of grass. Um, let me see. Let's just see because he is going to move now. So he's, you can see he's still playing with it and moving. Come on. If he moves it a little bit out of where it is now and away from this close bank, then it's going to work to go back where we were. See if he lies there. If you lie there, then we're going to. No, now you're going to put the stick with. Oh, there we go, playing with the scrubby again. I think step. Let's go back again. It's going to be better. So I'm going to go back again because Seb's really battling the way we are here.
Well, sorry guys, I did say our movement might mean that we lose reception. So we've now sat tight and we are in a beautiful spot to see not only those there's also lay in the way. I'm just gonna say thanks to Peter quickly. Thank you, Peter. Hello. How are you doing? Fine Good, thank you very much. Cheers guys. So just saying to Peter quickly. Hello, Asana. How are you? Are you well? Yes, you are. Gonna fly. <laughs> there we go. Monique and
Well, this is our version of thermal that Seb and I have tried to recreate from the only place that we can get signal. It's so far away, and with the spotlight, it almost looks like a thermal image of Husana playing with his scrub hair. There's no other way that we can get to anywhere close to where he is to see him clearly. We've tried every available option, but there's just no signal from anywhere but where he is. But it looks like he's walking towards us. Is he walking? No, he's sat down again. Oh, it's very difficult. Unfortunately, just the angle of the banks doesn't really work. This is the kind of clearest view that we can get. Now, I was trying to think of a way to maybe try and get to where he is and to try and see if I can kind of get down into the, into the drainage itself. But the problem with that is that we won't have signal inside there. So, <sighs> alas, we sit and we hope that he moves slightly, that we'll get a better view of him. The infrared will just help us at least to see him outside of the light. Like I say, for him though, it's a clever place. Uh, you know, it's it's not ideal for us, but it's very clever for him. Della, you're asking if it's hard work for him catching the scrub here. Well, any hunting is hard work, you know. They stalk and they expend energy it's going low to the ground, creeping. And a scrub here is a fleet-footed animal, so it meant he would have had to have really caught it by surprise and chased it a few steps, and there would have been some energy exerted. But it's not like wrestling with a big, fully-grown male impala where you'd have to hold on and suffocate it. Once he's grabbed the scrub here, then it's quite quick and easy for him to kill it. So not as hard work as the ant big antelope species, but still a bit of work nonetheless, and he's definitely done well to be able to catch what he's caught and to get the food that he needs. You can see he's just playing now. <laughs> You're a silly cat. Sharon, you asking how long before leopards leave their mothers? Well, generally between... Oh, where are you off to? You can see he's having a full game. Um, between 14 months and two years, that's generally what we see with leopards. That's how they normally will kind of spend their their years or months with a, a mother and then the mothers start to move off um, but it depends on the leopard sometimes a little bit earlier sometimes a bit later the most extreme I've seen is three and a half years that's the longest I've ever seen a male leopard stay with his mom and also I've seen a leopard at 10 months old being left by its mother so it just depends on the individual and the mother itself and the availability of food and all kinds of other things that go into it really is a pity that he's just lying behind that clump of grass if he was one meter the other side of that clump of grass we would have the most perfect view of him from where we are now because it's a nice sort of gap that we've got here and, and if he had gone and lay in this more open section it would have been far more pleasant but with him playing so much maybe he's going to pick it up and run this way and we'll see him coming into this area Christy, you want to know the largest animal that I've seen Osana hunt? Well, I mean, we saw him the other day with an impala that was looked like one of the yearlings, but I know that he has killed a fully grown male impala and put it up into a tree. So he has killed that, which is a, which is a large individual. I mean, that's a large animal for even a female leopard. So he's done fairly well with that. Um, but that's it. I haven't heard of him going after kudu yet or anything like that, or warthog, big four male warthogs, which he will in time. And once he becomes a big male leopard, he's definitely going to start going after things like that. It's just going to take a bit of time for him to get to be strong enough and big enough to really tackle those guys and make it easy enough for him to grab them and, and pull them down. You know, when he's still so small like he is now, he doesn't have the strength yet to fight with those big, big antelope. Remember, he only probably weighs, I would say at most at the moment about 120 pounds or 60 kilograms whereas kudu and big male warthogs those are well over 100 so they're going to be strong powerful animals and they're going to make it very difficult for him you see when he comes out a little bit it's really quite nice it's beautiful watching him and we can see him playing look at that <laughs> what are you doing silly cat are you having fun are you expending more energy playing than you would have done to hunt it
cat's tails you're saying Hassan is making your days having so much fun I know it is it's amazing when you see a cat like this when they just seem to have lots of joy in them and there's lots of energy and they're jumping around and they're chasing and they're trying to bite things and it's just a wonderful experience it's a good way to kind of finish your day on a good in a good place and there's something about wild animals when they are playful that just fills you with you know a sense of happiness and a sense of that there is more to this world than the doom and gloom that we see on the news every day and that moments like this are special and that we're very privileged to be able to spend time with a cat like this and watch its playful nature especially one that we know so well and have followed for so long what are you doing <laughs> Paula, you're wondering if they're playing with it just to make it more tender and easier to eat. Well, Paula, no, not really. So it's it's more just he's a young leopard. If you found somebody like Tingana or Mvula, they wouldn't do this. They would just grab it and they would just start chomping away. It's more a youthful phase that he's going through. Um, it's not in any way tenderizing that meat. You'd have to play with it a lot harder than what he is now. It's just that he's a young leopard. He's, you know... He, theoretically could still have been with his mom in which case he would have been playing with her and he would have been playing with his sister and it would have been a whole bit of, a whole lot different in his life so he's still got that curious cub nature and so it's more that than anything else once he gets older and more territorial you'll find that this will stop and he won't become as playful with his food and definitely will not sort of chuck it around as much as what he's doing now it also shows you that he's not particularly hungry because if he was ravenous he would have tucked into that very quickly so he's come off two big kills and that means that he's actually can take it quite easy and not have to stress about shoving it in too fast sounds like some of the hippos are pushing one another around behind the damn wall as well come boy come this way no you're going further down you know what seb i wonder if we go try go further down we might get a better view of him now Oh, he looks like <laughs> he looks like a rodeo bull now he's, now he's looking up at us as if to say what do you guys why are you laughing at me but he was jumping around like when you see those bulls get let out of a rodeo in a rodeo sort of circuit and they go crazy and back legs are jumping all over the place that's what it looked like when he was doing that so you can see how far he is he's a long way away i'm going to try and see if we can get a bit closer because it's just so magical watching him play like this i'll hopefully we won't lose reception but we're going to risk it anyway because it really is so nice to see him playing but from where we are we're missing a lot of what's going on from being too far away so we're going to risk it i hope none of you will mind and hopefully it will be worthwhile for us i'm going to try and just see seb if we go here I wonder, I wonder, I wonder, I wonder. I mean, I could get down there, but it's like I say, we probably would lose reception if I went down there. So I'm going to try and just get in to a point where we can maybe try. Hopefully, like I say, that we will keep reception. So we still have me, apparently, and we still have a branch and a tires, hopefully, after going through that. Here we go. There's going to be your best bet, I think, Seb. How's that? So I'll get out of your way, but this is going to be much better for us to... No, don't go around the corner now. Excellent. We still have reception, which is fantastic news. But this is much better. Now we can at least see him and not a blob of light in the distance. But he is so playful. What are you doing? We're being spoiled tonight. These kind of sightings are not every day and we don't get to see this activity of leopards all that often. So it really is a special thing to see. And Marion, you say it reminds you of your pet cat. Well, exactly. It's just like a domestic cat playing with a mouse or something like that. In fact, Graham Wellington, who's sent us a video the other day in the staff group of his pet cat playing with the mouse, and it's a very similar situation. It seems as though he's really gotten... There we go. Oh. <laughs> Oh no, it's attacking him. <laughs> what are you doing, you silly, silly cat? And 
this is just all good and even though he's playing with it is actually really good because he's learning little techniques so he's using his paws he's biting at it and this will all stand him in good stead when he's actually going to be hunting when he grabs a prey item this will all help in that regard so even though it looks like a, a game to him he's still honing skills and building muscle in those legs and around that throat and around that neck area that's going to really help him later in life be able to hunt better and so these things are very important it's the same as when he was playing with Shongile and and the rest this would have really helped him kind of develop the skills to hunt and maybe all those games with Shongile up the trees and down the trees and falling in and out and chasing things has what made him into the hunter that he is today also he would have watched Karula and he would have got some serious um, amount of lessons from her she's definitely would have taught him some things no, don't go behind the corner there come back the side it was so nice when he was on this side because we could see him really playing with what he was with what with the scrub here no don't go that way no <laughs> seems as though he's gonna lie down where we can't see him Asana, that's not very nice of you it seems as though the best spot for us to see is exactly where we have no signal which is just Murphy's law as well and gremlins always hide in the best spots so I'll try and evict the gremlins and hopefully he will come back around with the scrub here lying closer to where we are he hopefully will move around that corner again back towards us I don't think there's any other way we're going to be able to see him than from where we are now cat's tails you say hosannas pure joy is infectious it is infectious well I'm gonna try and move one more time because we can't just sit and stare at a blank bank of sand so hopefully this will not lose signal and we'll be able to still see what's going on I'm gonna try and sneak in the nice thing about having smaller Land Rovers is that we can just get into small little gaps like this so careful there Seb he's right below me so we should be able to see him can you see him from there, Seb? Let's see. We're going to be all right, Seb. Yeah. Oh, look at that. Wonderful. That's better. So we can actually see, and we can see the scrub here. And we've got strong signal, according to Megan. Well, that's fantastic news. So it is a bit of an aerial view. This is not a view you'll get every day of a leopard, watching from above and seeing his head and his neck and his back so clearly. But it is a nice view nonetheless. At least we can see him and we can see where he is and how he's going to play around with his scrub here it should be a lot better than where we were all those sort of that distance away the problem is I can't go much closer than this otherwise the vehicle's going to be in the way so we're in the perfect place you can see he's itching a little bit in those wounds I would imagine flies are landing on them every now and then you can see he's got lots of issues with flies we were talking about it earlier that there are a lot around with this increase in heat all of a sudden we've had a lot more flies I would imagine also with the increase in heat has meant that there's an increase in in the predators catching food because animals are going to become far more weaker when it ca comes into this heat and they're going to have to try and you know go down towards water holes like Chitwa where Hosanna and varying other leopards are going to be lying in wait we know a treehouse dam is where he had his last kill Tundi killed at treehouse dam and so and there's going to be a lot more weak animals which means that there's a lot more carcasses where flies can lay eggs and and therefore reproduce we also know that last year we had an absolute boom in the fly numbers because of the dead buffalo and hippos that were all over the place due to the drought so lots of flies the sign of crazy but many others as we try and teach you relaxed at all he's very restless with It's still a really cool view. It's such a different perspective of a leopard. You know, it's not very often leopards actually they're relaxed enough to allow vehicles to park pretty much on top of them. And when I say on top of them, I mean above them. They they tend to be a little bit more kind of wary of a vehicle above them than they are of a vehicle. Look, he's stalking and he's going to pounce. <laughs> oh, it's stuck to his. Such an incredible sighting. So, wondering if there's a spotlight, and that's because, unlike us that have IR vision, affect the animals. The guys out here that have guess, they can't see when it gets dark, so they use a spotlight, and they'll use spotlights on animals that are active at night. And Hosanna's eyes and his pupils are 
positive and he'll be able to react, react to the spotlight very quickly and it actually it doesn't have too much effect I was speaking he was telling me that the the lights actually don't affect cat's eyes as much as you would think it would so the spotlight as much as I know it's a little bit irritating of it dancing around all over the place it is necessary for the other guys to be able to see what's going on so just bear with it I'm afraid it's just part of the safari experience out here we're so fortunate at Juma that generally we spend a lot of time with our leopards on our own and that's when we can go into infrared and we can you know be far more ethical towards any of the animals by using that infrared light and must remember that it wasn't long ago that we didn't have infrared ourselves and we used to have to use spotlights and various floodlights on the car to be able to try and see animals in the dark when they're at their most active you must remember that these cats now that it's dark is when he's going to be active you know you would have spent the whole day resting oh look at this we are being <sighs> spoiled this is so cool <laughs> what are you doing How amazing is this? <laughs> Rose, a uh, bit macabre, but quite funny. You say that it was doing more things dead than it was when it was alive. Uh, yes, I think it's it's definitely moving, doing a lot more flick flacks than what it would have done when it was alive. Which is, I mean, it's, it's a sad thing when you see an animal that's no longer alive, but at the end of the day, they need to be eaten and, and the predators need to survive somehow. So that's how it all works. Now this car is leaving, which means the spotlight will go off for a bit. So we can, we'll switch to infrared, which means that it will go a little bit darker and it will go black and white so that we can actually see him. And so you can see, look what he's doing now. He's now going to start feeding, I think. He's licking and grooming, getting rid of all that fur because that fur is very difficult for him to be able to digest. And now he's using his teeth to just pluck it. You see, so he's plucking bits of fur off, getting rid of that before he can expose the skin when he'll start then to feed off it. So this is the start of him feeding. First he played a little bit, now he's plucking. And then once he's plucked and opened that skin, then you'll find he's going to start really eating. And... And as I said, I'd be very surprised if he's still in the exact same spot tomorrow morning. This will be finished fairly quickly. Mouth and his paws in comparison to that food item, it's not going to last very long and he'll feed off that. But then there's water right here, so I don't think he's going to go too far. I'd imagine he'll be somewhere close. Look at all the fur that he's gotten just from plucking. It's amazing how they can use those teeth. You would think that they would struggle with the teeth to be able to actually pull it out. But you can see just how much fur he pulled out and now he's got some stuck in his teeth. It can't be very pleasant when you get fur stuck in your teeth. And his tongue is so full of hooks that it's going to make it very difficult to actually get that fur out. It's often funny to watch cats when they feed like this. How amazing is this, guys? What a way for us to have spent our last sort of 45 minutes of drive. I think it's about half an hour, 45 minutes. We really have been spoiled by Hosanna. He's not just been a flat, tired, hot cat. He's had his scrub hair and the, was, the scrub hair was dangling in his mouth and now to watch him playing all over the place really is super special and you can see look he's listening to the hippos and all the other cars that are coming because there's going to be two other cars arriving because it's now the time of the day where the guys are starting to go back to their lodges and we're right at Chitra Lodge so the Chitra guides are coming in this direction which means we also are going to have to make space fairly shortly because there is three vehicles that want to come in here so we don't want to hog it too much but we'll stay a little bit longer since it's almost the end of our drive and, and then the others can come in but they're really going to struggle So, Sebastian, you're wondering if um, leopards sleep on the ground or in the trees? The answer to that. Um, obviously, leopards, everyone kind of has this notion that they are only tree-dwelling creatures. That's not actually true. So, leopards do spend a lot of their time in not only trees, but on the ground. In fact, more time on the ground than in trees. They go up into trees when they have carcasses, or if there's a, it's really hot and there's a lot of insects that are irritating them on the ground, then they'll go up into a tree to try and rest there. Or if it's very wet on the ground, then you'll find that they go up into the trees. But you can see once the light goes off, it's very difficult. Even the infrared light is being blocked by the light of the infrared, by the grass, I should say. So I'll try and just 
see if I can help you there, Seb, although he's tucked his head behind a lot of grass. So this light will just be able to help us see through the grass because otherwise our infrared light is all being absorbed by the grass and we can't see beyond it. So I'm just going to try and shine a little bit and see just for the last few minutes while we watch him. I was surprised. I thought he was going to start feeding properly, but he seems to have now decided that's enough. He's not going to eat just yet. He'll go back to that just now. Obviously didn't like the taste of fur. Tony, you say he's going to get a hairball? Yes, well, a very big hairball by the time he's actually eaten through that entire scrub hair because the scrub hair is going to be difficult to groom all that hair off. You'll find he will eat some of it and even when he defecates there's going to be a lot of hair in that dung and you find after this often they'll go and eat grass and the grass will just help them sometimes get a little bit sick and that gets out all that stuff that they're battling to digest so maybe a few bits of bone and hair that is kind of in that area. Come on boy, wait. go back to your kill where we can see you a little bit better. There we go. He's listening to us. <laughs> I think he's going to stalk it again. Paul, you say even in black and white they look amazing. Well Paul, there's something about the black and white that just brings out the contrast of their coat. So those rosette looks that much better. Oh, look at him go. I'm going to turn off my light because there's somebody else that's got a light there and we can see now that he's in the open. But you can see the contrast of the coat and there's just something about it. The other thing that there is is a million mosquitoes here. Can you hear them, Seb, buzzing around our ears? So there's mosquitoes everywhere, which is the first sign of mosquitoes of the summer and means that we're probably in all likelihood going to get overrun at some point. If there's already mosquitoes in this dry weather, as soon as it gets to the wet weather, we're going to have a bit of a problem, I think. So I'll have to start to packing some of our mosquito repellent over the next little bit. He's tucking in to start feeding. He's see, I think he's also struggling with all the insects as well. I suppose, you know, with the lights and varying other things, the insects will be attracted to this area. We're also right next to a dam, so we, the insects are going to be far more. It's maybe why he stops feeding, is it just the insects get a little bit too much and irritate him. And then he kind of walks away for a bit and hopes that the insects move off and then he goes back again. The nice thing for him is that the flies will disappear as the night goes on. So he's not going to have to worry about flies too much. It's just going to be more the little midges and mayflies and varying other little insects that come out of the water. And obviously mosquitoes as well. But unfortunately I think he's going to settle right there where we can't really see much of his face anymore. Also, there's quite a number of vehicles that want to come into this area, so I think what we're going to do... <laughs> so I believe all of you are saying he must just eat it already. Well, it would be nice, wouldn't it, if he did decide to just start eating it, because he's kind of played and he's messed around for quite a while today, and it would be nice if he just sort of started crunching down and that was the end of that. It seems as though he is starting to do that. It looks as though he's gotten far more comfortable now. He's found himself a tight little spot and he's slowly but surely looks like he's starting to eat. It's difficult from where Seb is because of that long grass that's in the way of his face, but from where I am I can see he's slowly but surely starting to put his mouth down and, and crunch down a little bit more than he's actually licking. So I think he is going to start feeding soon. Maybe not, if the insects have anything to do with it. Come on, Hosanna. You must eat your meal. And like I say, he's probably expended more energy playing with it than he's actually going to get out of the scrub here. I don't think he's going to get that much nutrition out of it, and yet he's spent so much playing around. Now, Sharon, you say you're thanking the scrub here for allowing Hosanna a nutritional meal and to survive. Well, this is the way it works out here. You know, some days... The prey wins, sometimes the predators do. And you, if you think this week we followed Hosanna, we followed Tingana, we followed Shadow, 
all three of them hunted. All three of them got within five meters, but not one of them was successful. So the prey items do get away a lot, and it is vitally important that the predators obviously feed to stay healthy. So as much as it's sad to see carcasses and to see dead animals, like I say, it's vitally important for these predators to get their nutrition. Otherwise, we wouldn't see them, and we wouldn't have these amazing characters that we do in the form of Hosanna and Shungila and Tamba and all these leopards that we get to see on a daily basis. It would be a lot sort of bleaker world if we didn't get to see them that's for sure i know many of you love spending time with them right it's that time of the day though it's time for me to start saying goodbye because we're reaching that stage and i believe a lot of you have enjoyed the solo drive i've immensely enjoyed myself as well and it's thanks to all of you for asking lots of questions and being a part of it and i hope that you really enjoyed this afternoon as we went around the alphabets we didn't really get that too far and if the internet's not working in the morrow tomorrow well we'll just continue in the morning with the rest in the second half of the alphabet but it's been such a fantastic afternoon i've really enjoyed it we've bumbled about we've seen lots of interesting little things discuss trees and various other stuff and then we finished it off with what well, the best way that you could and that's a leopard so let's take one last look of our leopard while i enjoy all the insects that are around my lights and in my face but for myself and sebastian and megan thank you very much for joining us and we'll see you tomorrow on the sunrise safari